Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode, where we're covering chapters 35 through 41 of A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass. But before we dive into this episode, please listen closely to our content warning. While we're focusing our discussion on chapters 35 through 41 and book one, we are going to bring in themes, foreshadowing lore, and other insights across the series. So yes, these episodes are spoiler central for the whole Akatar series. These Akatar deep dives do not, however, have spoilers for the rest of Sarah J. Mass's series, except at the end of some episodes, including this one, where we include our Mass vs. Madness segment. We'll include a big old spoiler warning beforehand, so if you haven't read the rest of the Mass vs., you can leave the episode right there, or you can keep listening for Throne of Glass and slash or Crescent City crossover call outs. So with all of that said, if you don't know why Reese, our baby, is taking some hard L's today, please go finish the series. We will be here when you're done. Next, we of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things about adult books. In other words, folks, this podcast is rated R. Gruesome injuries, painting bodies, bodies, <laughs> licking someone's face. This episode has it all. So please be mindful of little listening ears. We also want to share a different kind of exciting announcement with you today. Lexi and I are thrilled to be media and podcasting partners for Romanticy Book Con in Los Angeles, February 20th through 22nd in 2025. It'll be three jam-packed days of all things fantasy romance, including a masquerade ball, a murder mystery party, Akatar inspired high tea hosted by us fantasy fangirls, author panels, a fantasy fangirls live show. I'm so excited for that. And and so much more. There's so much packed into these three days. Get all the details and you can purchase tickets at fabledfantasyevents.com. We'll also have the link in the show notes and we hope to see you there. We're getting so many messages from you all who are coming. We cannot wait to meet you. Oh, I'm so excited. We also have a lot of other events coming up for this year, 2024. So please stay tuned for a lot more coming your way. Last thing before we jump into our Akatar episode seven, if you love fantasy fangirls, if you've been loving this Akatar our journey we're on together. If you want more content, more community, more events, early access to ad-free episodes, and copies of our gigantic outlines, please check out our Patreon. We have two membership tiers that you can join, the Valkyries for $5 a month and the High Fae for $10 a month. And honestly, our Patreon is the best people in the entire world. I will die on that hill. Join the Patreon party at patreon.com slash fantasy fangirls. The link is also in the show notes or YouTube caption, depending how you're listening and really and truly thank you so much for helping make fantasy fangirls our livelihood it means the world to us and now it is time to listen to the music of <gasps> volaris i'm so excited what? nicole's gonna open up this discussion with a summary of what happens in chapters 35 through 41 which yes we originally planned to include chapter 42 for today's episode as well but we realized that was crazy to try and fit it all in so our final episode will include chapter 42 and it'll be chapter 42 through 46 anyways gather around friends we need an inner circle debrief Chapter 35, waking up in her prison cell, Lucian comes to visit Feyre for a verbal beat down, but at least he heals her broken nose, points for Lucian, and quickly vanishes. Later, two guards drag Feyre into the throne room where Amarantha takes one out of Rhysand's book and asks for Feyre's name. Refusing to share that info, the Adder Bartok drags Lucian forward to kick him, sir, into sharing Feyre's name. I will never say it any other way when it involves Adder Bartok. You'll be shocked to know in this moment that Tamlin does nothing. Pharaoh, not wanting to see her friend get hurt, immediately gives up her name. Amarantha tells Pharaoh this riddle that, if answered correctly, would free the spring court, just the spring court, instantaneously. But Pharaoh hears it and is like, Mm, come again? Back in her cell, Feyre attempts to work out the riddle, but she doesn't make it very far because two days later, the guards appear to take her to her first trial. Chapter 36. Feyre is dragged into an arena with Amarantha and the High Lords and a rowdy crowd where she gets the info on her first tasks. I guess Amarantha's been seeing the new Dune movie because Feyre is supposed to hunt something big. Oh, wiggly! And it eats and poops everything! It's an Alaskan Worm. 
from a that was really good <laughs> thank you I watched it last night in preparation for this I appreciate it in this muddy and smelly arena Feyre runs away from this terrifying creature but tapping into her hunter skills Feyre quickly learns that this worm is blind using this knowledge to her advantage she makes a trap for Mr. Worm she creates bone spikes in the worm's lair slicing open her hand to lure the worm with blood getting the worm to follow her the worm impales itself on the bone spikes and Feyre has won her first trial you might say that there ain't nothing too big or too ornery for her to cat. That's my last SpongeBob reference, I promise. But uh-oh, Feyre's arm is feeling kind of funny. Chapter 37, Feyre's not doing well, y'all. Her arm is infected and it's looking like Feyre in her human healing might be dying sooner than she expected. Well, it was nice knowing you, Feyre, but a shadow ripples in her cell. Welcome back, High Lord of the Night Court. Rhysand offers her a deal. We can almost hear Alice screaming, no! He will heal her, but she will have to spend time every month in the night court with him. The lightning speed in which I would sell my soul and then some to this man. Feyre is like, nah, this is nothing. It'll heal. But Reese, making a very convincing argument, finally persuades Feyre to concede. She negotiates on one week a month in the night court and he will heal her. Reese Anne agrees and heals Feyre. She's healed! But in place of her fatally injured arm is now a sleeve tattoo ending in an eye on her palm. Timmy Tam's gonna be mad. Chapter 38. Feyre is in her Cinderella era and is scrubbing floors, but this water is disgusting. Disgusting. Feyre, infuriated with her impossible task, is greeted by Lady Autumn, Lucian's mother, and Lady Autumn cleans the water in exchange for Feyre giving up her name to save Lucian. The next day, Cinderella is cleaning lentils out of a random fireplace, but it's a timed test because if she doesn't complete it, the owner of the room will come and peel her skin off like a fresh banana. After what seems like forever with very little to show for it, the room's owner walks in it's Resand. Shocking. Do you like the sight of her kneeling before you, Resand? Reese tells Feyre that all the High Lords can shapeshift and that he preferred something a little bit more bat-like, giving her a little teaser of what's to come in Chapter 55 in Akamath, but without the sex. Womp womp. Feyre asks if Resand knows the answer to the riddle, and he shares that even if he wanted to, he couldn't tell her. Impressed with her nerve, he vanishes all the lentils and tells the guards that they are not allowed to make her do any more Cinderella chores. Chapter 39. After more days in her cell, but at least now with yummier food, two shadow visitors come to take Feyre away way, washing her, applying makeup, body paint, putting her in a sheer white dress, looking like a heathen god's plaything. Turns out she's Rhysand's date for the midsummer celebration in the throne room. At the party, Reese lets Amarantha and Tamlin know about their little deal, and Tamlin shockingly does nothing. Reese offers fairy wine to Feyre, and again, you can hear Alice being like, really? Feyre drinks and instantly blacks out. Must have been Everclear. Waking up the next day, then immediately vomiting, Lucian visits Feyre, letting her know that she's an idiot for making a deal with Rhysand, and that he would have come to heal her, but he was beaten to hell after helping her during her first task. She would have been dead, Lucian, but okay. He also fills in some blanks from the night before. Reese made you give him a lap dance all night. Feyre was indeed the drunkest girl at the party. We've all been there, Feyre. But Tamlin is not under a spell. He's just not reacting. So Amarantha doesn't know what to use against him with Feyre. Well, this might be the first time he's never reacted but okay. For the next month, Feyre is washed, painted, drug, and dancing. One night, Amarantha orders Reese to help her by entering the mind of a high fae who tried to escape. Reese does as she wishes, but says that the summer court fae was working alone, clearly lying to save some summer court ass. Amarantha gives the order to fry the summer fairy. He follows her orders, but gives him a clean death. Chapter 40. It's second task time! In the throne room, the floor beneath Feyre starts to lower and shows an iron gate with Lucian trapped behind it and a word puzzle on the other wall. Oh, and for some extra fun, let's have some flaming spikes lower over Feyre and Lucian slowly descending to kill them like grapes. The only problem is Feyre darling cannot read. Panicking, she reaches for the multiple choice option B and picks answer two. This was also my technique for the SATs and you know what? It worked pretty well for me. But turns out Feyre is not so lucky. A sharp pain shoots through her new tattoo from Reese when she tried to reach for the second lever and same with the first, but not with the third lever. Feyre pulls the lever, crunk! Right, lover! The spikes stop advancing. Feyre saves her and Lucian from being squashed and burned. But despite just working her way through two of the three tasks, Feyre begins to break and knowing that the third will definitely kill her. Reese enters her cell that night and like a kitty cat, licks her tears away and taunts her about being illiterate. Interesting flirting method, Reese, but it keeps Feyre Darling from breaking completely. Chapter 41. Feyre has become a shell of her old self and begins looking forward to each night's blissful oblivion from the fairy wine. But 
But on her way to get painted up one night, Feyre and the two shadowy women come across some hot gossip. They overhear from Adder Bartok that the King of Highburn is pissed with Amarantha. The two shadowy creatures are clearly more spies than Feyre's dressers. However, one night alone in her cell, Feyre begins to hear beautiful music accompanied by beautiful images of her flying next to a palace in the sky. She weeps, remembering that she's fighting for her high lord, Timmy Tam. Cue the surreals. Not that one! Yay, Nicole! <laughs> Thank you so much for that very intense inner circle debrief. <laughs> you know, sometimes I wonder what we were thinking when we map out these episodes, you know, for the chapter sections. And this was definitely one where at the time we were like, yeah, that'll be a lot, but that's just a future Lexi and Nicole problem. And now, like, here we are. And in other words, just get ready for a really long episode, your friends. <laughs> and yeah, this episode, it might be a little overwhelming, but you know what else feels overwhelming? Shopping for skincare products that actually work for your unique skin. The amount of times I've stood in an aisle at the store with like all the skincare options, it's like a double-sided aisle, you know, and I'm just like frozen. I've been doing this on repeat for about 15 years. And when I would finally land on an option, and after an embarrassing amount of time, by the way, overwhelm is real, I would bring it home only to have my skin break out more. Finding skincare products that actually work for you, it's complicated. And that's why we're excited to partner with Apostrophe, the sponsor of this episode. Whether you're dealing with breakouts, signs of aging or acne scarring, Apostrophe will help you love the skin you're in. My experience with Apostrophe has been nothing short of amazing. I was able to get a tailored treatment from an expert dermatology team without having to deal with the hassle of an in-person appointment, a trip to the pharmacy, or almost breaking down in a store aisle like I've done many times. And seriously, it's made such a difference for my skin. If you're watching on YouTube, my skin is glowing. It is glowing. Thank you, Apostrophe. <laughs> we have a special deal for our audience. Get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash FF when you use our code FF. That's a savings of $15. This code is only available for our listeners. To get started, go to apostrophe.com slash FF and click get started. Then use our code FF at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you, Apostrophe, for sponsoring this episode. All right, Nicole, it is time to step into the cauldron and discuss key insights, foreshadowing theories, and oh, so much more. One of the things that we're going to be talking about a lot is Feyre in her cell because we spend most of these chapters <laughs> with Feyre in her cell. She wakes up quite literally beaten to hell and you can literally feel the survival mode. She dons it on like a jacket again. She's surveying the damage after Adder Bartok keeked her sir last episode. She's planning what she can use as bandages. She's saying that she deserves this because of what happened to Claire. This is heartbreaking to see. We discussed Feyre's survival mode through the majority of the first stretch of our deep dive here. And Fabra was starting to get hopeful. She was starting to become happy and creative back in the spring court. And now she is right back in that I got to put one foot in front of the other mindset. We've also pointed out throughout this Akatar deep dive, especially in our early episodes, how much foreshadowing there is to this prison cell Fabra will be in under the mountain. And well, here we are, friends. It's gut-wrenching with the echoing screams that she can hear of others being tortured. Like, what a mindfuck that would be, just in and of itself right there. Well, speaking of mindfuck, Lucian arrives. <laughs> and I have been marinating on what you said last episode, Lex, about your fury with Feyre going under the mountain. And it looks like Lucian agrees with you. And it is a fair point. But I do have to agree with Feyre here because... Number one, she is here now. And Lucian saying, what are you doing here, you stupid human fool? Which, kindness, Lucian. She literally holds your future in her hands. Like, come on, dude. <laughs> That's a good point. Help her. <laughs> It's pointless anger that he's sharing with her. I get that he's angry. She's the easiest person to take it out on because obvious reasons. But number two, she was still in her hope arrow when she entered under the mountain. She thought that there was a small chance that she might be able to break the curse. So yeah, Lucian, of course she did this. Like, can you imagine if she never went under the mountain? She ended up just going back to the human lands after Alice's mega onboarding download. That what if would have haunted her for ever the rest of her human life. I absolutely hear you. And I really do agree, especially that Feyre, she is here now. So we might as well follow her lead and make the most of it, even if Lucian and I are right, which, you know, she <laughs> does end up making the most of it. Like you say, like, what would have happened if she never did this? Like, what if? So again, I am sticking to my theory that I'm not saying that I'm mad at her 
for not trying or not putting up a fight and, you know, like trying to help everybody, especially after she fucked up in the first place. But I am saying go to the surreal, go figure out a different plan than literally going in with no plan. So I promise I'm leaving all that anger at Thera from last episode behind me. I'm over it. I can move on and go back to loving on our girl because let's just be honest, she's definitely going to need that extra love and support this episode because poor, poor Thera. Yeah, this is a rough episode for <laughs> Thera. Now, the, one of the things that Lucian says is that all of the High Lords are forbidden to leave under the mountain over the next three months, aka over Thera's trials. I'm curious as to why they're not allowed to leave. Is Amarantha wanting to sell out the arena? Like, is this maximum attendance kind of a thing? But you had a few really good points on this. I understand it more as a way for Amarantha to do two things. Number one is to let these high lords and their courts have a little bit of hope, just a sliver of it, that this human girl will be their salvation. But then when Feyre fails, then all of that hope is crushed. Amarantha has a reputation for not just breaking bones, but also souls. She breaks people into submission. And I think that this is just one more way for her to do that and to take that sliver of hope away from these high fae and their courts. Along the same lines of giving them that tiny glimpse of hope, Amarantha also needs to keep order and control during this game of hers. She needs to keep the high lords on a tight leash and give them just enough hope to feel something so that they can later break, but not enough leniency to plan and act on that hope, which would of course be easier to do outside of Under the Mountain, where she and her cronies aren't watching their every move. So that's, I think, why she keeping everybody down here right now. I think that's, especially that second point makes all the sense in the world. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, Amarantha's paranoid. Like, she is not a confident queen. She is so paranoid of losing control. So definitely that reason. She is and she's got confidence. It's so straight. Like, she's a really interesting dynamic of a character because, yes, she is very paranoid, but she also loves to play her games. So she's like paranoidly playing her games, but she also has the confidence that she will win this game against Thera. I think about her almost like Lord Voldemort style, where it's all of yes. the insecurities are driving her forward. It's not from confidence. It's not from like, it's the, I have to win because that's the, it's like the Delulu, I have to win. Like, that's more how I look at it. Feyre begins to ask Lucian, quote, is Tamlin... But Lucian not only cuts her off. Again, this is after I missed one. Was it last episode or the episode prior? I'm now <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> missing them. So not only does Lucian cut her off here, but then the guards come to change rotation and Lucian has to leave, which God damn it. This dramatic tension around characters not being able to finish their sentence is just... Now, I would imagine that she was about to ask Lucian some form of, is Tamlin all right under Amarantha's spell, supposed spell? But that does beg the question that if she learned this early on that Tamlin is not under a spell and he's just being a vacant shell of a human, obviously for his reasons, we will question those reasons later. Do you think her perception of Cham Tamlin would have changed over these three months? Do you think that she would have come to the conclusion of why, wait, he's really doing nothing earlier if she hadn't learned it after trial it's like right before trial number two, I think. Favorite even thinks in the throne room later this scene, quote, why did Tamlin do nothing, say nothing? So she's already starting to plant that seed of, dude, d help me. Like yeah. I'm risking my neck for you and you're not doing anything. I'm gonna have a lot of anger at Tamlin in this episode. <laughs> so, so to answer your question about would that have changed her perception about him if she knew that he was not under a spell earlier? And I don't think that it would have changed very much because when Lucian does end up telling her, no, he is not under a spell and he is acting this way, almost like a well, duh, yeah. Thera, like this is why he's not doing anything, like obviously. And the way that it comes off in that way for her and for us readers, it's like, oh, of course he's not doing anything. Like we we are automatically siding with that reasoning and such. Like we might still kind of question it, but again, Tamlin is the romantic interest in this book. So of course we are going to forgive him because Thera is. So I don't think that she would have been more angry with him if she she just found this information out earlier. But I also do love that even once when she does get that information, she still feels frustrated with him. It's a little bit more subconscious, but we are still getting those little hints throughout her narration. And then it's really going to come to a bottleneck in Akamath there. I do think that obviously when she figures it, when she learns from Lucian later on in the stretch that your point right here is perfect. It's, it is in that like, well, duh, Feyre. He does have a line where he's like, 
I'm kind of questioning why he's doing it this way. I'm paraphrasing. He says we're playing, he's playing a very dangerous game. Yep. And I do think that if Aira had more time to question the full scope of Tamlin's motives of kind of be like, okay, why is he doing it this way? Why is he doing it that way? Maybe, but I also do know that like we've said in previous episodes, she is also in the rose colored glasses of a new relationship, even under the mountain where the love interest can do no wrong. Your partner is a pedestal and they are amazing and sunshine, butterflies and rainbows, even under the mountain when they're sitting on a throne and doing nothing. So I do agree with you. I don't think it would have changed much. I, it is interesting to think about how her internal monologue would have changed. Like, would she have questioned his motives more? Would she have just been like, oh, I hope he's okay more? Because she does that a lot, which drives me insane. It's also interesting that Amarantha gave Lucian some of his power back to entice Tamlin to be with her. First of all, I love Lucian, but it's proven time and time again that he has no real sway over Tamlin. Again, he's his emissary, he's his friend, but like he doesn't actually have that much sway over him, at least as much as everybody thinks he does. He offers advice or caution to Tamlin, who then just never listens to Lucian. Yes, yeah, so there might be a few little instances here and there, but overall, no, Tamlin does not listen to him. So it's funny that Amarantha thinks he will. So speaking of Tamlin and Amarantha, now is as good a time as any to dive into the very popular theory that Amarantha and Tamlin are mates because it would be such an intriguing, if now somewhat irrelevant, plot twist. The idea is that Amarantha and Tamlin are mates and Tamlin rejected the mating bond, which has not sat well with Amarantha. There's quite a bit of circumstantial evidence to support this theory that I'm going to walk through right here. Number one, Amarantha Amarantha is dead set on bringing Tamlin to her side and making him her consort and lover. Her focus on making this happen brings out that extra crazy in her, how she tortures Claire out of jealousy and hatred, how she doesn't give up on Tamlin no matter how much he pushes her away over the centuries. Maybe she's also trying to make him jealous with Reese, knowing that they're enemies. There's a lot of curiosity as to why Amarantha is so obsessed with Tamlin and making him hers. Mamber Pig does seem her her type like seriously though with the South Park reference he is absolutely her type man bear pig if you've seen any of those episodes <laughs> but if they are mates this would make a lot of sense with her obsession like if she can't have her mate then oh my god nobody can have her mate reason number two for this theory Tamlin is desperate to fall in love with Feyre not just because of the curse but also because he is trying to prove to himself that his mate is someone else yes. or on the other hand he knows that they can't be mates because he technically already had one. There's a line in Akamath when Farev assumes that the mating bond between them will snap into place sometime after the wedding. But I don't believe we ever get those same sentiments directly from Tamlin. There's kind of a misconception that he is also thinking this. But if you look at it and read it, it's actually only from Farev's perspective. So Tamlin either knows it will never happen, and this is only Farev assuming, or off page, he did say something like this, that it will snap into place after the wedding. And his hope for their mating bond is his denial that he was indeed mates with Amarantha. Number three, even though he rejects the mating bond, Tamlin killing Amarantha damaged him more than we as readers could ever comprehend because it is unfathomable to kill your mate. Part of his trauma is from murdering his mate. And this is possibly even an unwanted contribution to his depression that is exhibited in Akamath. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but Amarantha will look at Tamlin before he kills her and whisper, please, to him please have mercy. Please kill me quickly so the others don't drag it out. Please don't kill me at all because we're mates. There's a lot of weight to that please there. Number four, there's also an assumption that Tamlin doesn't have a lot of respect for the mating bond since he will tell the king of Highburn to sever the mating bond between Farah and Reese and take her away from her mate. Now, there's a lot more to it than he doesn't respect the mating bond, but Tamlin may be drawing from his own experiences with a mating bond, or he doesn't put much faith in it. He doesn't see it as a good thing based on his parents' relationship and his own mating bond rejection with Amarantha. So therefore, he's like, fuck the mating bond. I don't care give me my girl back. Last but not least, number five, this could even explain why Tamlin's heart was turned to stone. When he rejected the mating bond back at the masquerade party, Amarantha turned his heart to stone and rolled it on up into the curse. 
So with all of that circumstantial evidence laid out, here are our thoughts. I'll be honest, I was not on this theory train before this deep dive. But after walking through all of that, and especially reading Amarantha's please, I'm suddenly like, okay, I could see how this would be possible. Does it have any impact on our bigger story? No, we've moved on from Amarantha and the plot. But it is fascinating to think about this additional possible context. I've been on the record saying I don't think Tamlin has or ever will have a mate. And while I do believe that Tamlin needs some inner self healing and not a mate, it would be poetic and in character for him to indeed have had a mate. But he rejected it because she's evil and he is horrified. That is who the cauldron dubs his equal. Love this. <laughs> I really enjoy the idea of Tamlin already having had a mate. Now, whether that's Amarantha, which is my preferred option, I do also really like the idea of Reese and sister. I think that there's a lot of plot holes that would need to be filled in order for that to have a really big impact in the story. I love this added element of the please. I can't wait to get to that next episode. Would this be possible to be confirmed in a future book? Or is this just ever going to be up for speculation? I do want to bring up SJM's recent Instagram stories of like five or six videos, uh, excuse me, five, four videos, five stories of the spring court. And this was on the first day of spring and it sent the entire fandom into absolute spirals. There were videos of someone making breakfast of like eggs and bacon, like, which was also from like years ago, I think. So it was like something she had to really dig up. So it definitely did raise some eyebrows. Now, a lot of people saw those stories and thinking that that means the next book is going to have more spring court, whether that's through Elaine, Lucian, or Tam. Tamlin. Now, whether that's through a Tamlin POV, I I highly doubt it. I do not think we're going to get a Tamlin POV. I definitely think we're leaning more towards an Elaine and Lucian. But if it is more spring court focused, most likely, but not most likely, that's pretty much confirmation we will get more Tamlin. Are we going to get a Tamlin, I'm going to call it a Tamlin sob story? Like think, it, think chapter 54, but it's Tamlin. <laughs> like... <laughs> never wanted something and not wanted something so badly at the same time <laughs> yes, exactly. like do I, do I even want to say that like no but like I would definitely still read it <laughs> I, oh I would absolutely I would gobble it up like even if we get a Tamlin POV novella I will still gobble it up because he is such an interesting character for us to dissect do I enjoy the idea of being in his head or even being in a third person POV with him no but it would give us more insights to his character. I really like this theory that Tamlin has already had a mate. I like it more that he's been with Amar or like that his mate was Amarantha because it makes Tamlin that extra, what's your Shrek, the Shrek quote, like the layers, you know, like, the onion layers, the yeah. onion layers. Like <laughs> it, it makes him have more onion layers, which I think for him, it's important to have because it is really easy for the fandom to be like, well, black and white Tamlin sucks. We hate him. And don't get me wrong. I don't love Tamlin, but I think that the complexity of his character we're not done exploring yet. And I could see that meaning that we get a mate confirmation. I will say if we did get a Tamlin POV, I would really not want there to be just an excuse for all the wrong things that he did. <sighs> that is a little bit of a tiny gripe with Reese where it's like everything is conveniently explained and we'll get into that at, at a later time. And of course, it's because he's love interest and we love Reese and all of that. But if we got something similar with Tamlin, there are some real nuances of re toxic relationship issues that I would have a problem with getting just explained away there. But Same. that's, yeah. No, I agree completely. We then enter the throne room. This is not the throne room scene I like reading. I like reading <laughs> the one in Akamath and maybe the one in Iron Flame too. Not maybe. That's a confirmation, period. I love the one in Iron Flame. But we get a throne room scene and apparently the guards did not take a leaf out of Tamlin's book when he magically drugs Feyre every time she enters or exits the spring court with him. Because on their way up to the throne room, these guards are dragging Feyre and she notes the exact exit out of the dungeon. Again, it's that survival brain coming to the forefront. She is so accustomed to immediately getting back into this mindset. And here she is just being like, how do I get out of here? Let me note the little scratches on the wall in order to like find the right path. It's brilliant and it's heartbreaking at the same time. So I know I promised I'm done being mad at Feyre <laughs> and I really am. Stop laughing, Nicole. However, <laughs> I need to point this one thing out. 
She spots fairies in the crowd with masks on, meaning they're from the spring court. And if she had any chance of finding allies, it would be with them. That's what Farah thinks. But Farah, I feel like they'd be a little mad at you for their high lord choosing your short mortal life. Again, I love you and I don't want you to die, but you do have a very short mortal life compared to them and your safety over all of the spring court. And then you still came here with no plan being like, okay, I'm ready to die. And again, trying to save everybody, but really accepting your death and fate and the sacrifice that everybody just did. Just, I promise I'm not mad at her anymore. I'm I don't know. Still having to get it out. <laughs> so their sacrifice, they didn't even have a say over in the first place. It doesn't matter. So I'm just saying that if I was a spring court fairy, I would not be very happy with her and I would not want to ally with her because she has proved she's not the smartest cookie just coming on down to under the mountain in the first place. I'm going to defend my girl for a second because <laughs> I think that the real anger in these spring court fairies would not be with Feyre. It would be with their fucking high lord who he made that leadership choice to send her away and damn his entire court. But remember Alice. Alice showed some resentment toward Thera. So I think that is a good example of how the others must be thinking about her too, where it's like, you stupid mortal. Why didn't you just say you loved him when you did? I think that's so unfair because she didn't know. Tamlin has been in the driver's seat this entire time making decisions because he's the leader. I, and I agree with you that they absolutely should be directing their anger at him too. I'm simply pointing <laughs> out that as she's like, oh, I can find allies in the spring court. It's like, girl... They're probably not very happy with you right now because their entire livelihood was sacrificed for you and you still came here. I agree that part of, I'm going to say human experience loosely here, but human experience would be to place an anger in Feyre. I think it's unfair because I don't think she is to blame in the slightest. That is what I'm saying. <laughs> Now, Amarantha asks Feyre for her name, and then she points to Claire's body, like as a, don't tell me your name, that's what's going to happen to you. Claire's body is still hung up, which we need to pause. Fairies have a heightened sense of smell to the point that they can literally smell arousal in someone. This is a rotting corpse <laughs> that has been strung up for weeks. Wouldn't they be like, gagging or maybe she or someone put like a glamour to make the smell go away and just like left the rotting look for everyone to bask in so i i imagine that this is another reminder and warning to everyone of look what i can do to you if you step out of line i also don't think that it necessarily just smells very good down there because claire is probably not the first example of something along these lines <laughs> you get really oh, hung up in this done. episode about these things and smelling <laughs> my hot take is that amarantha's nostrils are just burned to a crisp and she has no sense of smell <laughs> That is my hot take. But um, anyway, Feyre mentions how, quote, a black cloud wrapped around me as I sensed Claire's nail form to the wall behind me. The black cloud really stood out to me because I was like, oh, would this be like a Reese nod, you know, to him wanting to like his presence in the hall to like keep her safe? I don't think it would be like an actual like Reese, like mentally being like, let me cocoon you in my black fog. <laughs> like, I don't think it's anything like that, but it could just be like a nod to him. Or, and I'm leaning more towards this option, it's a way of SJM describing almost like a cumulus nimbus went over Feyre and the thought of the guilt that she feels towards Claire rotting uh, yeah. over her. Uh, that's, I, I'm guessing the latter there because otherwise it would have been described as a shadow. I think yeah. that when it is Reese kind of watching over her, whether that's consciously or unconsciously, he is described as a shadow. I think it is more of Feyre feeling very guilty about what happened to Claire and that is that black cloud. Then Reese is called forward by Amarantha and we get our first brushing of an invisible fleck of dust off his tunic. I have always pondered this habit of Reese's. Is it him trying to like, I'm, is this dust watch? This might be dust watch. <laughs> Here we go. But is this him trying to stall time before responding to someone? Is this him attempting to look like he doesn't care? Like that nonchalantness? Is this him, you know, trying to almost have like that confident swagger to take control of the situation back when he feels like he's losing it? Is it something else? I'm really going to be analyzing 
this behavior of his every time it happens. I'm guessing it's a trait of his when he wants to look like he doesn't care. But yes, we can definitely keep an eye on that moving forward with the podcast. I will say whenever I read this now about like that invisible fleck, I always think of the Cards Against Perithian game that I gave you for your birthday, where there's a card that says Resan's Lint Roller. And I just laugh every single time. (laughs) There's this trend going around right now that's like, what would make X character absolutely like fall over dead in the 21st century? And one person on the Resan one typed in a lint roller <laughs> yeah I, know, I, know. I thought it was so funny but with this resand and amarantha exchange we see favor's first epiphany quote-unquote that reese is playing a much bigger game he mentions how he doesn't recognize Feyre and that all human filth looks alike but she knows instantly that he's lying obviously because he recognized her in the dining room from their brief exchange on fire night and you know obviously a hell of a lot more that we will learn in the next book I also do love how in the midst of all this horror Feyre is like snorting at Reese like she's almost snorting at him this is just the beginning of their push and pull relationship and their banter that we're going to come to love so much even just in this stretch of chapters and their understanding of one another as well. She has such an inner circle reaction to him saying that Amaranth's face is a work of art because she knows he's bullshitting. And this little description is a sort of her at least inwardly calling him out on it. It just feels very inner circle-esque where it's like, that's totally something Cassian would do is just like snort at his friend for saying something really stupid like that. (laughs) I was thinking like more Amarin. Amarin would be like, really resand? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) When Amarantha then orders the adder to bring forth Lucian and Reese to hold his mind, which yikes. There's this line that really stood out to me. This is after the brothers like vultures are standing behind him. They're snickering and Lucian. And after Lucian looks to Tamlin and then he squares his shoulders like very ever the emissary, like I will take this blow for you kind of a thing. Quote, Lucian kept his eyes shut, ready. He was ready for Rhysan to wipe out everything he was to turn his mind, his self into dust. Remember how in Akamath, when Feyre thinks about accidentally slipping into Lucian's mind and Reese reading Feyre's mind in the moment, which we'll debate the morality of that moment when the time comes, but he reads Feyre's mind, understanding that she slipped into Lucian's, and he says out loud, oh, Lucian, what a miserable place to be. I bet you anything he's referring to this moment. That's interesting. I would not have put two and two together. I think he's probably referring to multiple moments, but I think that this is one of the most recent moments that he was in Lucian's mind in a very dark way. I'll say this. I don't think that you have to be in Lucian's mind to say that comment about what a miserable place to be. I love Lucian. Don't get me wrong, but he has gone through a lot of stuff, especially by the time that Reese says that. And Reese does not have very high opinions about Tamlin and the Spring Court and all of that. And for Lucian to essentially choose to be there with Tamlin, that automatically knocks him down a few pegs in Reese's mind. So I think it's more of a general character analysis and dig at Lucian rather than from personal experience being in his mind as well. Okay, I can see that. I I do think it's from personal experience of being in Lucian's mind. And it is interesting that the inside of Lucian's mind would be a very dark place because after Under the Mountain, like when we are in the beginnings of Akamath next book, he's the most normal out of the trio. Like he's, I'm going to put normal in air quotes. He's the most appearing normal. I think he's pushing a lot of shit down. Also, I do want to point out that Amarantha asks Tamlin to give up Feyre's name, but he will not. For his best friend of hundreds of years to save him, he will not give up the name of a human girl he's known for about half a year. I understand that this is a love story. I am a hopeless romantic at heart. That is, I would never want to be friends with Tamlin. Fuck this guy. Oh God, am I defending Tamlin under the mountain right now? Because I was about to say, like, it's a lose-lose situation for everybody involved, except for Amarantha, of course. Tamlin will later stick up for Lucian after Lucian's stunt, helping Feyre with the first task. However... I assume right here he is terrified of taking any action. No matter what he does, it will put Feyre at risk, which again, I got to mention, he's been avoiding putting her in harm's way ever since he sent her home. But yeah, this inaction, it is a bad look for Timmy Tam and it will continue to be so throughout this chapter and the rest of this book really (laughs) i do understand his reasoning to do it is to protect Feyre, and as romantic as that is 
I, I really do feel for Lucian and the rest of the Supreme Court. We are all forgetting about the rest of the Supreme Court, and I'm here just trying to represent them here. <laughs> Lucian is one of the biggest collateral damages under the mountain. And again, the fact that he is the most su- uh, supposedly normal in the beginning of Akamaf is a fucking miracle. Only under the mountain? He is serious collateral no, gonna... damage throughout this entire series. Like, don't I have, I'm going to have so many words for Farah again. I understand why she did what she did in Akawar. Daniel, when we had him on for our guest appearance, he made a very good point point about it i still really feel for lucian and being collateral damage through that lucian yes the spring court and tamlin less so but the fact that she was like sexually manipulating lucian like let's just call a spade a spade that was not cool that's that was not cool right there. like not that was cool not that was her okay. slytherin right there that is her <laughs> slytherin you have to wonder what would have happened if farah didn't give up her name would reese have melted lucian's brain and then to go into farah's mind where he'd then give amarantha maybe a fake name or does her name as long as it's not her family name really matter that much here because her big thing is not necessarily giving her name her first name it is giving her family name because of course she wants to keep her family safe i'm sorry to say this but i think reese might have killed lucian if she did not give up her name there's let's be honest there's no love lost between these two even if reese is on their side but Reese, he's always scheming to protect Farah, and I think that Lucian, again, would have been some collateral damage there. Well, in thinking, like, Reese's attraction to Farah aside, he saw her come under the mountain, and he started realizing she's our salvation. Yes. She's our way out. He would have done whatever to protect Farah because he is thinking about everyone under the mountain. <laughs> He's the only one, not probably not the only one. I would also give the summer court a lot of credit there in the winter court as well. But yes, I definitely agree. Reese would have killed Lu. I mean, not, let's not forget. He literally called him little Lucian. Like he is not a friend of Lucian's in the Yeah, they are, they are not friends. Yeah. No, I think he would have killed him pretty. <laughs> and Lucian pretty has instantly. no problem just calling him Amarantha's whore. Again, no love lost between these two. Well, speaking of no love lost between these two, Amarantha then turns to Lucian's brothers and we get our first description of what we can assume is Eris. Quote, he was lean, well-dressed, every inch of him a court trained bastard probably the eldest given the way even the ones who looked like born warriors stared at him with deference and calculation and fear we are going to spend a lot of time dissecting Eris, especially as we get to book three and beyond but it is interesting to note the court trained bastard here Oh, how true this is. And yet, who is he at his very core? It's interesting to see that Eris is supposedly egging on Lucian's demise here when he was actually the reason that Lucian made it out of the Autumn Court alive and with Tamlin. This will not be the first time I say this. I'm getting conflicting feelings from Eris. Yeah, so the descriptions of Eris under the mountain are so at odds with what we ultimately learn about him, like way more so than with Reese from, you know, book one to book two. This could be that Eris's character is not developed until later in the series and he was originally supposed to be evil that's just in and of itself a possibility that sjm did mean for him to just be a stereotypical bad guy and then later on gave him more complexities there so that he was written with this context of he is a bad guy versus reading between the lines but also while eris may be i'm not going to say good yet but not completely bad by the, you know like after what we know about him after silver flames He is still the eldest son of the High Lord of the Autumn Court. He was raised by a brutal father to be brutal. He is a schemer and he is in the lion's den and he is raised as a lion. So he is a lion in the lion's den. Well, not really under the mountain right now. But anyway, even if he helped Lucian escape all those decades ago, he is not going to blow his deep cover here under the mountain he even chuckles actually during the second task when lucian is you know chained and he's about to die that's not a good look for eris at all he's i guess he's essentially biding his time until he takes over the autumn court you know talk about like a morally gray character maybe more i'll call him morally black right now eris is definitely to be determined i have a lot of questions surrounding him But as of right now, under the mountain equals bad guy Eris. And I wouldn't be surprised that his more complex character development was decided way later in the series. I think that he's one of the characters I'm most excited to deep dive and to understand more as we go throughout this journey with these five books. Like, I think that he's one of the characters I'm really looking out for, in my opinion, changing of him. Yeah. Speaking of these brothers, though, Tamlin isn't watching Lucian or Feyre, but he's watching the sons of the High Lord 
board of the autumn court, as if to note which one was laughing the broadest. I wonder if Lucian's brothers remind Tamlin of his own brothers before they died. They were supposed to be cruel, and I bet you anything that this is one of the first things that Lucian and Tamlin bonded over. I bet you're right. I I also have to wonder if this is Tamlin's version of an intimidation tactic. He knows that the Autumn Court sons are scared of him, so maybe he's trying to inflict more fear in them right now. I love that it's the Tamlin's version of an intimidation (laughs) tactic. I like that little caveat right there. Instead of Taylor's version, it's Tamlin's version. (laughs) (laughs) But Feyre caves, and she does give her name, and quote, this is from Amarantha, Feyre, an old name from our earlier dialects. <laughs> the name itself, Feyre, means fair and beautiful, which seems very appropriate given the fact that this is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast. But if this ain't one of the biggest clues for Feyre being a descendant of the High Fae, what earlier dialects are we discussing here? There will be a few things I will say on this in Mass vs. Madness, but one of the things that Amarin mentions the Book of Breathings is written in is an early language. Really early language. I wonder if that's the language that Amarantha's referring to here. I don't want to say too much when we're not in the Mass vs. Madness segment, but I don't think it is the... Or I don't think it's the one from 15,000 years ago that we're familiar with. Okay. So I think it's a much more recent, but still an early dialect because otherwise she would have said our earliest or something that's like yeah. really, really old. But the fact that Amarin is even shocked by this ancient language being spoken, I don't think that this is from that because Amarin would have had, I'll say more of a reaction about her name, maybe. <gasps> that's so a good I, point. Yeah. So I think that this is more of just like a historical dialect, but not like the old dialect that we're all familiar with. But on the same note of Feyre's name here, I did go down a little bit of a Reddit spiral and Holly Plague mentioned how her name could also be a play on the Norse goddess Freja, Freja, I'm, um, I apologize, I might be mispronouncing that, but Freja is Old Norse for lady, also the most renowned of the Norse goddesses who was in charge of love, battle, and death. Her father was N- Njord, <laughs> Njord. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Njord, I'm going to just go with that. The sea god, which is so appropriate, pigs were sacred to this old goddess, and she rode a boar with golden bristles. <laughs> she rode man bear pig, oh my god. A golden man bear pig. <laughs> she also uses a magical cloak and is the symbol of fertility checks out and while we're on it yes i also did do the other archeron sisters as well i did not go quite down the same old norse rabbit hole with them but nesta is a welsh name for pure but in italy it means integrity and elaine is bright shining light like a day court light perhaps very possibly yeah i'm completely convinced that the archerons are a fey lineage like full stop it's yep. canon to me also this moment explained in akama 54 when Farah had given her name and reese is recounting it from his perspective quote hearing you say it it was like an answer to a question i'd been asking for 500 years oh my god <laughs> and in that moment reese decided right then and there that he was going to fight for freedom from amarantha fight to help this mortal who was our one chance to free them all you know good for reese and his solid decision making when it matters but you know that one decision we dread making every single day the exhausting decision of what is for dinner and with our busy schedules it can be so hard to carve out time for food that is not only tasty and fast but nutritious too well lexi it's funny that you mentioned that because this episode is sponsored by factor factor is a meal service that provides fresh never frozen food that is chef crafted dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes for me the variety that you get with factor is amazing. You can choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular like calorie smart options, keto, protein plus, vegan, veggie, you name it. Also discover more than 60 add-ons every single week, like breakfast, on the go lunch, snacks, beverages that'll help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. There's nothing more annoying than staring at your fridge after a long day of work and children and whatever else you have going on and feeling like you can't find anything to eat that sounds good. I can't tell you how often and this happens in my household. My husband and I were like, yep, it's a factor meal night literally just last night. (laughs) 
<laughs> so if easy and nutritious, like literally. <laughs> Us too, actually. <laughs> so if easy and nutritious two minute meals sound amazing to you too, Factors got you. Head over to factormeals.com slash fantasy fangirl50 and use code fantasy fangirl50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code fantasy fangirl50 at factormeals.com slash fantasy fangirl50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. We need to talk about this riddle. We finally yes. made it to the Amarantha riddle. Now, right before Amarantha starts spouting off brilliance here, Vera thinks, quote, everything became thick and murky. Did Amarantha do something to Feyre's mind to make it harder for her to think about the riddle's answer or harder for her to comprehend? I hadn't thought about that. I guess I assumed it was like when you're told not to think about an elephant. So all you do then is think about an elephant. Only in this instance, it's okay, you need to focus on this because your life and everybody else's life depends on it. And then of course, you can't focus. I'm not gonna lie, this exact same thing would have happened to me. My brain would have stopped working from the pressure too. my mind, it'll it just goes void when I hear a riddle. So yeah, and I need to see it in front of me too. Yeah. And the fact that she can't even read, and she has to rely on hearing like, Tell you what, Feyre would love audiobooks. <laughs> she really would. So here is the riddle itself. I'm going to read it word for word. Quote, there are those who seek me for a lifetime, but we never meet. And those I kiss, but who trample me beneath ungrateful feet. At times I seem to favor the clever and the fair, but I bless all those who are brave enough to dare. By large, my ministrations are soft handed and sweet, but scorned, I become a difficult beast to defeat. For though each of my strikes lands a powerful blow, when I kill, I do it slow. First and foremost, I vividly <laughs> remember hearing this and being like, it's some Harry Potter, the answer is love bullshit, I swear to God. And I was not actually thinking about the riddle itself. Like I was just thinking about <laughs> literature. But here's another thing I thought about is like, what if this is a beast? And then when she answers the riddle, it's like magically curated where that beast, whatever the answer to the riddle is, bursts out. And as they're freed instantaneously, the beast runs after them and tries to kill them like as they run away. <laughs> what? <laughs> now that you mentioned beasts, though, and, and I'm looking at the riddle right in front of me on this outline, but scorned, I become a difficult beast to defeat. I find that really interesting and a really good parallel to Tamlin because he really goes into his base beast mode when he is scorned of love. And yeah, he does become a difficult beast to defeat because he is just like all up in everybody's business and, and he's really pissed off about losing his girl. I also did not get it at all. And I never would have if I truly tried. I was very, I was one of those people who was very much along the ride for the riddle. I was listening to it and to even have a chance at getting it, I would have needed to read it because that's how my brain works. A few days ago, Nicole, I went back through our text exchanges when I first read this and this is what I said about the riddle. I pulled out my text message to Nicole. I'm expecting the answer to come in as a last minute, aha moment when Farah realizes what it is after reflecting on a memory or looking within herself or her surroundings or something. So while I didn't guess the answer to the riddle, I did guess how Farah would figure it out. Proud. I, honestly, <laughs> the fact that you were able to go back to those text exchange, where is that stored in the depths of your phone? Because we text so much. That is actually very impressive. And this is like last September. I have a really fantastic search option where I can oh. search all of our text, our images, our links, all of that kind of stuff, locations, things along those lines. Because I oh. have a Google phone I and mean, it might be Android, but it is superior and I will die on that hill. <laughs> if you are one of the readers who figured it out right away, good for you. You get a gold star. And if you didn't, don't worry, you're in good company. I went down a Reddit rabbit hole, as we tend to do. And I saw that user Bam Bam Beerum thought another fitting answer to this riddle would be wine. And that Reese kept having Farah drink the wine as a hint to her. Anyway, I just wanted to add that in because I think wine would have also been a clever answer. Another answer I've seen a lot of people say fits is freedom, which would have been very fitting for the story as yes. well. But yeah, so like when you really think about it, love is, of course, the most fitting answer, not just to the riddle, but also because it's really embodies the story as well. I think the fandom is generally in agreement here that yes, it is a little bit cheesy, but you know what? That's okay because we're all along here for this ride. Let's also remember that Farah has had a very 
rocky relationship with love her whole life, like we've analyzed extensively in this podcast. So the fact that her mind immediately goes to a disease or something bad is very in character for her. She can only reflect on what she personally knows and has experienced. Later, she'll dwell on various kinds of poisonous and venomous animals. Again, bad things that a survivor would think of first, not love. I don't fault her at all for not guessing the riddle. And I can appreciate that the more she thinks about it, the harder the riddle feels. We all know that feeling of being too close to something where we have blinders on and we can't see the otherwise obvious answer. And, you know, this is literally one of those situations right here. Plus, Farah is a little preoccupied with a record stretching emphasis on immediately or instantaneously because ah, she did not specify when they would be freed with the trial agreement. Besides, you know, the obvious plot convenience, I would really like to know why Amarantha gave Vera this riddle option in the first place. Actually, I take that back. I do know why. She is so smug and feels so righteous that she knows how humans truly are and that they can't truly understand love, so therefore she couldn't possibly guess this correctly. Amarantha underestimates humans and is doing this as a way to taunt Vera. But I, I'll just say it's still quite the loop poll that she's giving her just because like there's no real rhyme or reason again except pot convenience that she does this except just to kind of poke Farah a little bit more what if the fact that the answer is love is also kind of a fuck you if we're going back to the mates with tamlin thing if the answer is love to this riddle and she's giving literally Tamlin supposed love this, I don't know. I could see that also being a, mm, you think that you're in love with this, but like, here's real love. Like, you know, like she can't even figure out love. Like she doesn't love you. I love you. And I think that also plays into her whole perception of humans. Like, cause she does not think that humans are capable of love because yeah. from her own experience of Jurian and her sister. So Yes. All right, friends. We're now at the first task. Okay. So she goes up against a dragon and she has to fly on her broom. So wait, wait, wrong fandom. Okay. So each of the three tasks will highlight an aspect. Actually, she does go up against a dragon. <laughs> yeah, she does. I feel like it's her type of dragon. Oh, man. It's okay. Harry goes up against it. a wyvern, so it's fucking yeah. fine. <laughs> Each of the three tasks will highlight an aspect of Farah's book one journey, which she has to quite literally overcome in some way, shape, or form. The first task brings her right back to her hunting and survival mode, which is actually really great because that's her strongest strength. Yay! Amarantha mentions how she took it upon herself to learn more about Farah and that Rhysan told her that Farah was a huntress. If you were like me, on the first read, maybe even a few rereads, you were like, why? Oh, Fucking why would you share that info, Reese? But then I thought about it. I calmed down and then I thought about it. If Feyre is a hunter and she knew enough about hunting to have killed a fairy and starting this whole chain of events, she would have had an advantage in this Amarantha's first cruel task of hers. Now, I do wonder how much he knew about her skill level, because if she was just average, he would have royally fucked up here. But I bet anything that he knew she was a talented hunter and he knew that he was giving her an advantage in this fight. In chapter 54, I scoured that chapter and it says that he saw visions, you know, when he was like seeing visions of her life, he saw a warren of rabbits. Maybe from that, he knew that she was out in the wild, but it's not, there was no hunting mentioned there. So I think it was really Reese knocking on wood and hoping for the best. And enter the midden guard worm, aka the Alaskan bullworm, aka the sandworm from Dune. So something that we have to note here that we find really interesting is that because we are in Farah's POV, she calls it a worm spelled W-O-R-M. We don't actually learn the full name and see the correct spelling until Akamath, when two of Tamlin's sentinels compliment Farah on how she handled herself against the worm now spelled W-Y-R-M. So this is one more example of getting information from Farah's POV. She doesn't know it's a worm spelled with a Y. It just looks like a big worm spelled with an O to her. So that's how it is presented to us here. And in case you were like, what is a worm spelled with a Y, W-Y-R-M? Worm spelled with a Y is a type of dragon. Here is your fantasy fangirls dragon class crash course. A dragon has two wings and four legs like its wings are coming out of its back a wyvern has 
two wings, almost like they are their arms, and two legs in the back. A drake has no wings, but four legs. It's basically like a, a lizard panther. And a worm, spelled W-Y-R-M, has no wings and no legs. Literally, it is the Alaskan bullworm. The Alaskan bullworm! <laughs> I literally had the outline pulled up on one side of my screen and SpongeBob SquarePants worm episode pulled up on the other side of my screen. And Brett looks over my shoulder. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, I'm working. <laughs> I'm working. <laughs> again, I also want to point out that these fairies have a heightened sense of smell. <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> and they are in an arena filled with worm poop. Did Am- again, did Amaranda lose her sense of smell? Because even Feyre is like, this smells terrible. And she's a human. And this would smell so bad if you're Fey. <laughs> See, I just assume that Amarantha is basking in it. Well, first of all, I never thought about this in the first place until you brought it up. But now that I am thinking about it, knowing how much it would be bothering Feyre and everybody else, like, of course, Amarantha would be basking in it. Can't stop laughing about how hung up you are about these fairies and what they can smell here under the mountain. <laughs> Like, to be surrounded by, like, the worst smell in the entire world, it would not be great. It would not be great. I like to think that there's magic that is making the smell not so bad for them. Like, there's, like, an invisible barrier or something to that effect where magic is making it so nobody else is gagging here. That would be my assumption. That is my, that is going to be my headcanon, because or else I've got (laughs) really hung up on it. (laughs) I love seeing Feyre's hunting mind at work here. She realizes that this worm has to take its corner slower because of its size. She also notes how it didn't go after her when she was stuck trying to squeeze through a passageway and learns that it's blind. And she also notes that because it's blind, it has to rely on a sense of smell. Like she is multitasking so well right now as she's literally running for her life. She's like, mm, it's blind. <laughs> like, she notes how every animal den has two exits. I learned something new in this rebrand. <laughs> I didn't know that. That was an exciting piece of information. She's so calculating to weighing the risk and reward of her actions, knowing that every move, every decision, every second counts, and she's not willing to waste a single wrong step. Ah, and how she tells herself it won't end like this as she's sobbing, fighting for her life. She's like, it won't end like this. Like, I will not die like this. Feyre, say it with Violet Sorengale. I will not die today. It is moments like this, though, that I want to note. I would... I. As much Gryffindor confidence as I have, as much writer's quadrant confidence as I have, I would not survive in a fantasy story because my brain would not be able to sprint running for my life and also figure out a plan at the same time. I would just sprint and run around until I wear myself out and then I get eaten by a worm. Yeah, I'm the same mode. I would have definitely gone into panic mode and I would have been eaten before I could possibly even kick into survivor mode. I also want to do a quick note here. When Feyre is in the hole, like with all the bones and such, Amarantha calls out that she's ruining everyone's fun. Feyre thinks that, quote, she said it as if I was a lousy shuttlecock partner. If you also didn't know what shuttlecock is, (laughs) it is another term for the game of badminton. What a random game to pull out of the sky into the story. There's actually a game called shuttlecock (laughs) that like people play with serious straight faces. I can't even play golf with my husband without laughing at balls and shafts and all of those other words. But there's something called shuttlecock. Like the only image that I have is a literal depiction of these words, super bad style. <laughs> this is the giant hanging balls all over again. Oh, which I also love that people still DM us of like literally like gigantic hanging balls, like like the Christmas markets and stuff like that in Europe. And they're like, this is all I can think of, Lexi. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> we are leaving our mark on the world, sis. <laughs> One inappropriate joke at a time. <laughs> now everybody's going to go out and start playing shuttlecock. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> tag us we're curious to see this game in action now shuttlecocks aside (laughs) it's serious i can't do it Feyre has a brilliant plan a brilliant beyond brilliant plan breaking bones and impaling them into the mud poop so that the sharp side is sticking up she fills this little cavern with all of these spikes making it so that the worm will be killed on its own dinner bones But she's not done. She also covers every inch of herself in this poop mud, which pause. I love this moment. 
despite the poop mud. I love how these other fairies are calling Thera an it, but then Reese replies back when they're like, what's it doing? What's it doing? And he replies back with, she's building a trap. He's proud of her. Even as she's glowering at him and giving him vulgar gestures, he's smiling at her with twinkling eyes. And I love how he calls her she versus an it like everybody else. And as she's like giving him these vulgar gestures, he's probably like, oh, she's going to be so good at getting the ring from the weaver. (laughs) Just kidding. I don't think he's quite there yet. But still, his true feelings about her are all over the pages once when you understand the true context. I think he actually is quite there yet because this is the moment that he realizes he's in love with her. In Akamath chapter 55, a rare moment where we're not quoting chapter 54, he says, quote, I think I fell in love with you the moment I realized you were cleaving those bones to make a trap for the Midgard worm, or maybe the moment you flipped me off for mocking you. It reminded me so much of Cassian, and for the first time in decades, I wanted to laugh. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that quote. Yep, you're right. That's so adorable. Which, okay, by the way, we've all seen that viral meme of Rachel from Friends doing that vulgar gesture, like the... (laughs) Where we all think that's exactly what SJM means when her characters do the same, like a vulgar gesture. Anyway, if you're not watching on YouTube, I'm making like intentional gestures right now, like the... (laughs) Here's the vulgar gesture. If you watch Friends, you totally know what I mean too, by the way. Yes, absolutely. That's all. I, like there's like there's that moment with Ross where he literally is like walking out of the apartment and he just goes like, like with a straight face. And yes. that's all I see Cassie and do in Akamath. <laughs> like that's it. Now I do want to pause real quick because I have a question about the layout of this arena. When Resand replies to the fairies who are like, what's it doing? He replies with her plan, like she's making a trap. But how big is this arena where there's fairies sitting far enough away where they're not collateral damage to the Midgard worm, but where Reese is also being able to be overheard by Feyre and she's able to make eye contact with him and flip him off. So here's what we know. Tamlin and Amarantha are on a platform about 20 feet above the trenches. There's kind of a mention that it like sinks down or like moves around a little bit. So I don't know what kind of platform it is, but at least we know it is 20 feet above the trenches. But also the spectators have to be high enough up where the worm doesn't go over and just choose to eat them instead of Feyre. Or maybe the worm is small. Like if 20, like 20 feet up is not that high and worms have like these insane abdominal muscles where they can like, you know, like, a, I don't know, how, like a sphinx, <laughs> like they can kind of come up. And I'm rise. your impressions like, of this right <laughs> now. <laughs> where they can like, you know, breach basically. Like 20 feet up is not that high, especially it's so like, is the worm just like a baby slash a teenager? Did I ever think I'd have this many questions about a fucking worm? I did not. Okay, let's just take this beat by beat here. <laughs> Some of the spectators do interact with the worm at one point as they're, you know, like feeding it. So I've always figured it's like a stadium and Amarantha, Tamlin, Rees, and the other high lords and nobles are closest. Like they probably do have some kind of protective magic. Again, like my answer for most things is magic because we live in a magical world. (laughs) So the worm doesn't go after them. Like in the writing style of this, we can't have a Harry Potter third task may situation here. It would make the scene so boring boring if they can't see what's going on with the crowd or hearing them especially with Reese so I think we just kind of have to chalk it up to maybe magic is involved and 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 they have good hearing I just 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 let it work that's all I have to say is just (laughs) let it work (laughs) after Feyre scouts out the worm but then loses sight of it again it is Lucian pause of course it's fucking Lucian who screams to your left letting her know where the worm is in the arena It does say, though, quote, then shattering the silence like a shooting star, a voice, Lucian's bellowed across the chamber to your left. I have never doubted that this was Lucian helping his friend out. And I I still like that a lot for their budding friendship, these two. But then this descriptive moment of shooting star language immediately made me think of Reese. And it dawned on me, what if Reese broke into Lucian's mind and commanded him to scream the warning to Feyre? Again, Lucian, collateral damage, though. (laughs) I guess I never thought of it like that. I mean, possibly. We want it to have been Lucian helping his friend, like, like you were just saying there, especially after she gave her name for his life. Like, that is why he says that he did it. I thought of the shooting star language more as a sign of hope for Farah. The night sky and stars mean hope and happiness for her. So it's that sliver of hope and that friendship with Lucian shining through here. 
Oh, I like that. That's good too. But our girl, she lures the worm into the hole and with the spikes, it impales itself on her trap and dies. Huzzah! 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 But on her way down to the pit, she lands on her side, flips over, and a bone is impaled into her arm. We will later learn that this is where she not only busts up her arm, but cuts her arm wide open and a bone is now sticking out of it. Yuck. And not let us not forget, she is covered in mud to the point where nothing is showing but her eyes. Gross. <laughs> and by the way, mud slash poop. If he didn't catch that already. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in SpongeBob, it's like, poop. <laughs> she is running on adrenaline here after she wins. And the real pain of her injury, it hasn't kicked in yet, which is lucky for Farah because she's staying strong. She is continuing to prove her grit to Amarantha. And yeah, I love that. It feels so appropriate to me that when Feyre wins, she looks up at Amarantha and like bares her teeth. This is a very primal Fey thing to do. <laughs> yes, Lexi, perfect, perfect execution. <laughs> yes. She even thinks how Amarantha is no longer grasping Tamlin's knee. Quote, Tamlin, my Tamlin. Hey, italics there with my. She's being territorial as she's burying her teeth <laughs> at the Fey Queen, taking her high lord. Again, that primal sense there. I, it, It's really fun how we see that all these little details there you can almost hear Rhysand going one of us one of us but then Feyre takes it a step further and like she's the Game of Thrones Night King herself she javelin throws the bone sword at Amarantha and it lands just a few feet shy I, I think it was more of an act of rebellion not a murder attempt she would have been a little bit more calculated there and it was more of just like a in the moment the adrenaline's going and she just needed to really show fuck you Amarantha I agree completely we will learned that all of her court but one person voted that Feyre would die I love how Feyre is like that's fair and as Feyre is pulled away back to her cell Amarantha says Resand, come here so from chapter 54, Rhys says about the first task and Farah winning, how he was always pretending to be the person that Farah hated, but he knew how hurt she was after killing the worm, and he realized this was his way in with her. Which, speaking of which, shall we get uh, into the deal? Yes, we shall. Let's make a deal. We need to take a moment and just highlight the state that Farah is in prior to this deal making situation. The bone is still embedded in her arm. She is still covered in mud slash Alaskan bullworm poop. The w <laughs> poop. <laughs> <laughs> the wound will not stop bleeding, which she says, and I know what that means. And I texted our, basically our brother, like we grew up with him. He's the closest thing we have to a brother who is about to graduate from medical school. And I was like, what does this mean? And he has read all the books. So he literally texts me back. He goes, can you give me a page number? I'll, I'll look it up. And I was like, I love you. And here's what he said, quote, okay, you're probably overthinking this one, but I think she's saying that if the blood continues to flow, she will bleed out and die. But then she's also got an infection, LOL. And then I said, well, that's not the first time I overthought something. The kind, wonderful, loving brother of mine said, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I mean, would we be fantasy fangirls if we didn't overthink things? <laughs> love you, bro. Shouts to you, Michael. We love you. And congratulations on graduating med school. He's single, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> yeah, this is a single straight doctor who reads romanticy. You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. <laughs> Back to this scene, though. <laughs> she has no appetite and the moldy food that's in her cell, <laughs> not to be the biggest buzzkill ever. <laughs> and she's determined one corner of her cell as the vomit corner. And now she is burning hot and her vision is going in and out. Pharaoh's not looking good, y'all. But who enters? But the most handsome high lord. Welcome back, Resand. Oh, man. So first of all, I just I love these descriptions that play into Reese's magic and being the high lord of the night court darkness rippling and him stepping out of that darkness as if he'd slipped in through the cracks between the wall and the door, hardly more than a shadow, just like hello, shadow daddy, our OG shadow daddy. As he enters with that feline grace, he sniffs because apparently he still has the ability to smell. 
and he grimaces at Feyre's vomit corner. On a first read, this is, of course, supposed to be like, ew, gross, what human filth. But on a reread, I think that grimace is actually to be read as disgust at the state that they're leaving her in. And seeing just how bad of a state she is indeed in. Reese and her bat boys, they've been through a whole lot of shit in their own lifetimes. And so this isn't foreign to him. But of course, he's pissed that it's happening to his girl, Farah, and he's limited in what he can do to help. Reese asks to see Farah's arm. And when she denies him, he grabs her elbow so that he can see the full spread of her injuries. Woof. And then he examines her arm, quote, a smile appearing on his sensuous lips. Why do you think he smiled? I think that, first of all, this is his in, as he admits to us later on in chapter 54. He's both letting a little of his own feelings shine through, but he's also masking them at the exact same time to serve his right now goal, which is to make Farah hate him. I, I agree with you definitely. I think that this is the realizing of the, his plan is his evil plan is working, quote unquote evil. I do think it's also this moment of him realizing he's touching her. He has had very limited experiences of touching her skin to skin. And while, you know, she's covered in Midgard worm poop, I think he also couldn't help but smile. But then here comes the deal. Hi, sharks. Resand is asking for two weeks with Feyre in the night court in exchange for healing services. Do, 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 do. What's the shark theme song? I do not know what the heck you're talking about right now. <laughs> the Shark Tank. Have you never watched Shark Tank? Might have every seen like a clip here and there. I don't oh watch Shark God. Tank. No. <laughs> oh, every entrepreneur walks in and they're like, hi, sharks. I'm asking for $45 billion in exchange for blank. <laughs> okay, that That's makes great. more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Love it when I have to explain my jokes. On here. Oh, hey, don't get me started on me having to explain things to you. <laughs> he mentions how this deal will come into play starting after all of this messy three trials business. He believes that she will overcome Amarantha. Now, I also assume that it's Resand. He's a little cocky, a lot cocky. He believes that with his assistance now, she will prevail and win under the mountain. And I do want to just say, way to support your girl, Resand. You're about to take a lot of L's. I want to give you this one thing. Even later, when telling Amarantha and Tamlin about this deal, he will look Amarantha dead in the eyes and say that this deal is for the rest of her life. This is a big old fuck you to Amarantha, basically saying, I believe she's going to beat you, bitch. And I love that in this back to this scene, Faber is like, no, I don't need your help. And Reese is like, quote, no. Really? <laughs> I love our cocky high lord. So I want to take a moment here because we've had several questions about how the logistics of this deal would work after the trials are over. Because if Farah wins and has to uphold her end of the bargain, she is leaving the freed spring court to go to the night court for one week every month. Remember that technically only the spring court is freed if Farah beats these trials. So Reese would still be leashed to Amarantha. Again, major technically here. Reese knows that when the spring court is freed, Tamlin will kill Amarantha, which will then free everyone. And that's all part of his plan. But that is not what is on paper here with the agreement with Amarantha. So Reese will be saying to Amarantha, hey, I'm going to be leaving under the mountain for a week every month to spend it with this human mortal in the night court. And some people are like, would she really let him do that? And I I, I think it's a little bit murky, but it does check out because number one, he does have a little bit more freedom and Amarantha might delight in knowing one of her pets, him, is continuing to torture the human girl every single month. But more than anything, Reese's bargain with Farah is irrelevant to Amarantha because she knows that Farah isn't leaving Under the Mountain alive or she knows that if Farah ever was to leave Under the Mountain, Amarantha would not be alive when this happens, which makes her like stiff and reaction all the more delicious but anyway i'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here so let's go back to Farah's cell i love this moment of how when he mentions it must have been lucian who healed her last time he says quote oh don't look so innocent the adder and his cronies broke your nose so unless you have some kind of magic you're not telling us about i don't think human bones heal that quickly not only is he possibly one of the only fairies under the mountain who does know human healing versus fairy healing. Remember, he fought on the human side of the war with a bunch of humans. He was in human injure camps. Like he, he knows what that looks like. But the fact that he mentions how he knew the adder broke her nose, 
he was in the back of the hall that day. Like, let us not forget, he would have had to be really observant in this moment to see her nose break. So I just love little lines like that that hit so much harder on a reread. Speaking of lines that hit so much harder on a reread, quote, this is Farah thinking to herself, though the world spun and danced in my vision, something primal inside me went still and cold beneath that gaze. Primal, yes, indeed. Hello, mating bond at work. We also need a pause here because Rhysan mentions how Lucian has been keeping a low profile. We later learn that this is because he was still healing from Tamlin having to whip him after he helped Feyre during the first task. But I actually need to pause this pause for a second. Tamlin didn't lift a finger to help Lucian when Rhysan almost melted Lucian's mind right in front of him. And now he decides to act Gosh, why am I having to defend Tamlin? I think that because Farah wasn't physically present, so she wasn't in as, I'll say, immediate of danger as she was previously when she was in the spotlight with, you know, like, what is your name, Farah, versus this time around where Lucian was about to get in trouble and Farah was not physically present, even though it was still technically about her. Again, I just want to say, I would never want to be friends with Tamlin. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I'm just looking at the context here. <laughs> it's fair, it's fair. Now back to my previous pause. He re says, quote, Amaranth is not exactly pleased with him. Tamlin even broke his delightful brooding to beg him to be spared. Again, Tamlin broke for Lucian now. On the one hand, I'm thrilled because yes, it's about time you break for your best friend of hundreds of years you better fucking have. But on the other hand, hold the fuck up. You watch the woman you love get beaten by the adder, literally have to run for her life from the Alaskan bullworm. And I might add that this is the woman you condemned your entire fucking court for. And in this moment, all Favor could think was, oh no, poor Tamlin for having to bestow the punishment onto Lucian, his best friend of 20,000 years and whatever. It's moments like this where I'm like, okay, SJM, I understand why you think that Farah is a, a Hufflepuff slash Slytherin because she literally hears that Tamlin didn't lift a fucking finger for her numerous times and he did lift a finger for Lucian and she's like, oh no, I hope Tamlin's all right. I have a lot of feelings. <laughs> Any defending of Tamlin you want to do there? Like, no, I do not want to defend him. <laughs> Any, I don't have an answer for that. I just wanted to call that out. I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> Feyre, back to this deal though. She is still being our stubborn girl. So Reese starts laying out the facts. Are you willing to risk it all, meaning your life, for the, the possibility that Lucian might come and save you? At first, yes, this is being harsh and blunt, and it is an L for Reese. We will get more to that in a second. But he knows her type of stubbornness because he deals with this shit regularly back home. He knows what buttons to push here. He also knows the fellow survivor mode that she's in. He lays it all out and he knows that with that, her stubbornness will ease, but it doesn't quite yet. And so she tells him to go to hell and he, he, oh, Reese, oh, Reese, baby. He reaches for her arm, takes the bone that's embedded in it and twists and resand here is your official deeming of an l my guy yeah okay so so let's talk about this because it is an official l yes uh, as we look at everything let's look at the reason why he did this because reese did this to really drive home his point he knows that she has to agree to this for his bigger plan to work and that this will save her life and she won't agree unless she really and truly understands how bad of shape she's in so yes to all of that here however he is inflicting excruciating pain onto Farah to prove his point, which is that she needs his healing help. And that uh, that is not okay, sir. It's just not. I'm no. not saying I have an alternative here, but that is not okay. Well, she spits in his face. That's her retort, which I love because this is another moment. He immediately laughs to her because I bet you anything he's thinking, yep, she would fit right in with this <laughs> inner circle of ours. Now, yes, again, Reese deserves an L here because he could have been more gentle. But for his ruse to continue, she had to hate him and he had to make a point. So he had to be a dick here. It's still an L. It is still an L. We have to be honest. Yep. And this is only the beginning of us saying he gets an L and here's his reasons why in this stretch of chapters. <laughs> We're doing a lot of seesawing here with Reese. <laughs> the fact that there is an and attached to this is not going to negate the fact that he deserves an L. Like there yes. are some moments where we also had 
Tamlin, here's an L and, yep. but we still gave him an L and a rating. And so we're definitely doing the same thing here. Now, only when Rhysand starts to leave, does this compel Feyre to start thinking in common sense? Lucian had sent her after the surreal underprepared. He even hesitated when she screamed. He gave her hallucination witch berries that caused her to literally spiral and Tamlin to throw him in a lake. And he also wanted to kill her from the start. With this line of thinking, of course, Feyre thinks, oh God, maybe he won't come to save me after all. During this whole run of this podcast, we have been talking about Lucian and Tamlin and their prejudice against humans. Much of that prejudice was also rooted in not really knowing how humans are. Let us not forget Tamlin's moment of, wow, your human mind can really comprehend art. Whoa, good go figure. That's just example A. So her faith in Lucian coming to the rescue, it really starts to falter. And so she begins bargaining with our boy Reese. It's interesting that when she asks him, what are the terms going to be for her stay in the night court? Reese answers, if I told you those things, there'd be no fun in it, would there? That language is so similar to Amarantha from when Farah had asked what the trials would look like. He's playing the bad guy so strategically, drawing parallels between himself and Amarantha to be painted as someone for Farah to hate. She thinks, quote, for Tamlin, for Tamlin, I'd sell my soul. It's ironic that she made this deal for Tamlin, and yet it's because of this deal that he loses his bride and eventually his love. Yes. <laughs> I love the irony. So finally, these two agree upon seven days in the night court a month in exchange for Rhysand's healing skills, and they make their deal and, quote, his smile became a bit wild. Again, another line that hits different on a reread because of these different options for it. And then our girl Farah gets healed. Huzzah! 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 We have so many huzzahs in this episode. <laughs> well, there's a butt attached to this huzzah. Yeah. <laughs> And that is, what's that on her arm? And it's time for another L4 resand. Yes, this tattoo is incredibly helpful in trial two. It sounds pretty with the flower pattern. It's like an elbow lace glove, but it's also got a feline-like eye. I also love that it's feline and a bunch of resands descriptive writing is in feline. I love that so much. But here's where his L really comes in. You marked her skin without permission, sir. That's not okay. And then he chastises her for being ungrateful when she's like, what the fuck? I mean, he is not wrong. <laughs> she was just saved from death. And she's like, I didn't ask for a tattoo. All jokes aside, I can understand why she's upset. This tattoo is an embodiment of her shame in agreeing to one week a month with the scariest motherfucker she's ever known. And yep. it was one more thing that is completely out of her control. She's also so concerned about what Tamlin will think. Again, subtle hint at the red flag in their relationship. She's immediately scared of telling her partner what she did to save her life because she knows his anger will flare up. Let's, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, highlight that there. But also, ah, it's just so exciting on a reread to see the first of these night court bargains that will become so familiar with. I also want to point out that when she and Amarantha made their bargain about the three trials, there was no tattoo because they are not in the night court. That is a night court specific thing there. And I just, again, I love how it's magically binding where she can taste the metallic tang of magic there. And it's just like the bargains and how it all works. I will definitely do a surreal tea time further along in the series on bargains because I just, I love it with the night court. We want to take a moment and pull this scene from Rhysand's point of view in chapter 54's download. Quote, when you were hurt so badly against the worm, I found my way in with you, a way to defy Amarantha, to spread the seeds of hope to those who knew how to read the message, and a way to keep you alive without seeming too suspicious. Oh, so good. Faber thinks at the end of this exchange that he must have done this only to hurt Tamlin. And well, yes, she's not far off, but it's not the malicious intent that she also associated with him leaving the head in the garden. I also <laughs> love, love, love how this was a subtle way for Reese to show hope to those under the mountain who recognize the signs that this is an act of defiance to Amarantha. The seven high lords will have a lot of opinions about Reese after this whole ordeal, but several in particular understand that he isn't as bad as he made himself out 
thought to be, like Tarquin and Helian as two of the most notable examples. Their courts were also among those that tried to rebel 40 years ago, and the previous High Lords and their families were killed. I will say this, and this is one of my big gripes with this series that we do love so much. I wish we got more politics among the courts in this series. There's so much potential, and we barely scrape the surface. Yeah, agreed. I think we get a little bit of it with the High Lords meeting, but that's like, that's one of my favorite stretches of chapters oh, in yeah. Akabor. God, I can't wait to get to it. And I, I really do wish we got more of that for sure, especially like yeah. Kalias and Helian. I just really think that there was so much there. In this also worried about Tamlin's reaction, we do have a metaphorical claw watch, I'm going to call it. She's thinking about how he's going to have this, what had she been thinking moment? She literally thinks about how his claws will punch out. Oh dear, she was dying. She saw a way out. It would be a healthy relationship for a partner to, yeah, sure, not maybe not be happy with this situation. Of course not. It's his enemy. He killed all of his family. We cannot overlook that. But one would hope that he would at least be grateful that she was healed and all right. Tamlin is not even here and she's afraid of his claws. Red yep. flag. Well, just like I am thirsty for resand, I have spent so much of my life trying to figure out how to effectively stay hydrated to quench my thirst. We've all carried around these massive water bottles or stood around the water cooler at an under the mountain party. But healthy hydration is not just about drinking water. It's about drinking water and electrolytes. And it makes sense. You lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches, and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. The solution obviously isn't to stop drinking water though. It's to drink water plus electrolytes. Enter Element. Element is an electrolyte solution that has enough sodium, potassium, and magnesium to get you feeling and performing your best. Plus, my personal favorite part is that it has zero sugar, artificial flavors, or other dodgy ingredients to hold you back. Always blown away by the amount of Element flavors. This morning, I am actually drinking watermelon salt. That is what is powering me through this super long episode. And I love when I get to drink my element. It's like I'm treating myself. It tastes so good. You are guaranteed to find an element flavor that you love. My personal favorite is mango chili <laughs> or raspberry or raspberry watermelon. Good. There are so <laughs> many good ones. <laughs> the citrus I'll, one's really good too. I just tried that one recently and ooh, I love it. Yes, or the grapefruit one too. Yeah. There's so many options. All of the flavors. <laughs> and element came up with a fantastic offer for us. Just go to drinklmnt.com slash FFG to get a free sample pack with any purchase. Thank you so much, Element. After the deal, we go into, like I mentioned in the ICD, the Cinderella era of Feyre's time under the mountain. Cinderella, Cinderella. <laughs> De De Cinderella. De Cinderella. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that movie in forever. How many Disney references have we made on this podcast? Oh, I don't even know anymore. I also have not seen that movie in forever. I tried putting that on for the kids and they were bored of it. As Feyre is cleaning the floors with this muddy, disgusting water, Feyre blatantly attempts to ignore her tattoo and the eye on her palm. Reese and Akamath will go on to say that he did use this eye to spy on her. And it does make me wonder how often he did this, specifically under the mountain. If I had to guess, I'd say often enough to make sure she's not losing it under the mountain. That's kind like how he does do his check-ins on her but also not frequently enough where he knew that she would be in his room when he comes in later when she's cleaning out the lentils so mama autumn lady of autumn enters side note real quick i love that her voice is described as quote sweet as sun warmed apples just already planting the seeds for she's not a part of the day court but she was in love with the high lord of the day court who was also under the mountain like yes I want Lady of Autumn and Helian's time under the mountain POV. That's what I want. That would be fascinating. Oh, I think it'd be really sad because like they're not together anymore and she That's chose true. her extra terrible husband. You know what? And... You make good points. I don't want that. that would be really sad. I don't want to read that. Never mind. Piggybacking on her voice description, I also just love her general descriptions as well, how she smells like roasting chestnuts and crackling fires. This right here makes me want to go live in the autumn court, you know, and if Baron wasn't the high lord and it was a nice, happy place like it should be because the autumn is amazing, I feel like we would all go and live in the autumn court. And this was SJM's way of being like, no, autumn court, we can't have everybody just want to live there. So we have to make the high lord bad. <laughs> well, she hates fall. Like oh, she's on really? the record saying how much she hates fall. Yeah. 
<laughs> I have feelings about that. I, lo- I, I love all of the seasons. I would live in the winter court, but I, if autumn court was cooler with the people living there, I would probably live in autumn court. I will say this. My husband's least favorite season is also fall, and it what? does hurt my heart a little bit. But I'm also not – fall is not my favorite, but it's also not, like, my least favorite. Did you just lose well, some respect for Brett? Well, then. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I or I was assuming it was everyone's favorite season. <laughs> summer court, baby. <laughs> Too hot in the summer. Oh, I would just lay in the water. I would just like bask in the water all day long. It would be great. Remember that the lady of the autumn court was born into a prominent family in the autumn court, and she was married off to Baron for a political alliance within the court. Her family had a powerful magical bloodline, and she also had the gift of fire, or we can at least assume that, which which Lucian inherited from her because it was obviously not Baron, since his father is actually Helian from the Day Court. Lady of Autumn makes Feyre's water clean and says, quote, for giving her, I am Arantha, your name in place of my son's life. My debt is paid. I mentioned in a previous episode, but it's important to note here too. The fact that Feyre saved Lucian's life would mean more to her than anything, considering that she most likely stayed in the Autumn Court to protect Lucian against Baron's wrath that this bastard child of his isn't his child and he had to raise him so i think we i I will respectfully say i'm not convinced that's why she stayed in the autumn court because i would have assumed that she would have left to the day court or whatever with lucian or she would have left while she was pregnant with him baron couldn't outwardly prove lucian wasn't his which is why the whole ruse even worked in the first place though he has always resented lucian because he assumed that lucian was not his and that was kind of like how he found out about the affair i feel like she stayed out of a sense of duty and guilt not wanting to stir up conflict between the courts and helian has kind of had to let the lady of autumn go because he recognizes she made the choice to stay in her unhappy life okay i see your points those are valid those are definitely valid it'll be interesting to go through specifically like akawar with this knowledge and kind of parse through the subtext and everything Yep, yep i also find it important to note that lucian's name in french means light day court also being the light of in the darkness of her life for sure like again he is her favorite son for multiple reasons but specifically the father that he has love that also wow like that really just solidifies that lucian (laughs) is the candlestick lumiere from beauty and the beast perfect tie-in i love that speaking of names though we never learned the lady of autumn's name typically sjm has a reason for not revealing names and well, I'll go into a few more theories on this, specifically in the Mass vs. Madness segment today. I do want to point out that if Lucian is a POV in Akatar 6 slash 5, whatever you want to call it, it is highly likely that he will learn his true parentage. I fucking hope so. The fact that he doesn't know really makes me sad. And maybe he will get more time with his mother. Maybe we'll get a name reveal with her, especially if we're getting more of Lucian's backstory. I really hope so. I really hope we get that. Me too. The next day, Feyre gets another impossible task, cleaning all the lentils out of a fireplace, and she must clean it up before the occupant returns or else he'll peel her skin off. Yummy. But as she's examining the room, quote, there was nothing else in the room beyond basic furniture, not even discarded clothes or books or weapons, as if its occupant never slept here. This we learn is Reese's room and correct. No, he doesn't sleep here because for the past 49 years, he primarily sleeps in Amarantha's bedroom. <sighs> Especially when you compare this empty and cold room with this townhome that feels lived in like a real home as it's described. Oh, my heart just hurts for our Reese and how much he must crave having a comfortable space to call his own. While Farah is under the mountain, she goes right into relying on her survival skills to help her because they've always proved to serve her well. They certainly did in her first task as she fumes over when she's trying to clean with the dirty water. You know, like, oh, like, like I can kill a worm, but this is going to be what gets me. And then here too. Two, Farah is like, okay, I can do this. I can spot rabbits in the underbrush from far away. I can find the lentils. And then, you know, womp womp, it's not good enough. I just find it so interesting how she always relies on that survival skill set and applies it to all of the tasks, big and small, in these instances whenever she can. After a few hours, Reese returns to his room. I think we can put that in quotations. And we get our first Farah darling. But this is 
interesting because this is also a name Amarantha uses for a lot of things. She says darling attached to both Claire and even Jurian's name. She says like darling Jurian when she's talking about the ring. I wonder if this is a habit she picked up from Reese or if this is one he picked up from her, but it just seems weird that he's using it given the fact that he hates Amarantha and does not want to be associated with anything that is her. So I, that, I don't know. That just raised some eyebrows on my end. Yeah, I go off about this when Amarantha calls her Farrah Darling before the second task because it actually really does bother me that they both use this word. I like to think that she did take it from him versus him taking it from her because I was getting really worked up when it was like, why is Reese using this? Like, it, it's not, suddenly not a cute little pet name anymore when you do this reread and you see that Amarantha uses the word darling quite often. It's interesting that her chore was to be done in Reese's room. Like he speculates, Amarantha or her her cronies think Reese will find some sport with Feyre. If he wasn't ultimately the good guy that we know he is, this would be absolutely terrifying. Their conversation leads to Reese pressing Feyre about what Amarantha would have to test him about. He reflects in chapter 54 that at least in the beginning of Amarantha's reign, she must have half wondered if he would try to kill her. But then he made sure things were so good that she stopped questioning and started trusting him. But Feyre is here calling him out. He bet on Feyre in the first trial and Amarantha didn't seem too happy about it. He also lied to Amarantha about Claire being the human girl when he knew that she wasn't. And while Farrah doesn't ask, there's a looming why question as she confronts him about these inconsistencies in his loyal demeanor with Amarantha and what she's learning is his actual agenda. That's when we get this very important moment from Resand. Quote, Amarantha plays her games and I play mine. And as for Fire Knight, I had my reasons to be out then. Do do not think, Feyre, that it did not cost me. We will get a recall moment of this exact line in chapter 54 of Akamath when he goes into those exact reasons why being out on fire night to see her, this human girl who has been showing up in his dreams, did in fact cost him. I love that the next description is, quote, he smiled again and it did not meet his eyes. These show don't tell descriptions are so important on a reread because right here on a first read, there's like this, you know, air of mystery about him. But on a reread, you can assume that he had to do more for Amarantha just to see Farah, And that's what the cost was. But his reasons were important to him. So, yeah, he smiles. But of course, it doesn't meet his eyes. I also love their banter just so much. I love their conversations and how there's so much more chemistry, even if it's unknowing to Farah right now with all of their back and forths because sorry Tamlin you just can't compete with the slyness that makes our enemies to lovers hearts sing your hair is clean <laughs> 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 then Feyre asks if Reese can also shapeshift like Tamlin. And we learned that all of the high lords can because they have a beast roaming beneath their skin. First off, what? I want to know more about this. What is Helians? I, I bet Helians is a Pegasus. Kalias is, I bet it's like an ice wolf or something. But I want to know. And uh, tar Tarquins, a dolphin? Like, what is this? <laughs> So uh, I agree. I This feels like such a toss away world building info. And I really do need to know more. To, again, like I mentioned this a little bit earlier, to be honest, I'm going to say this a lot as we go through the Akadar series, but I will happily accept this beautiful world that we do get. There's just so much more untapped potential among the other courts. Now, like you, I'm also thinking about what each of the other High Lords could be. But to be honest, like I'll say this, Man Bear Pig for the High Lord of the Spring Court would never have crossed my mind mind no matter how indecisive Tamlin is <laughs> although it is important to note Nicole like you had mentioned like a dolphin or something like that the high lords don't turn into animals That's that true. is a particular shape-shifting gift of Tamlin's the high lords turn into powerful beasts because it's not like Reese turns into a bat but more so a bat-like beast with talons and wings he's honestly more like a dragon which I the fan art is absolutely magnificent. Oh, a my black God, yeah. shadowy dragon. Oh, my God. Did we just go back to fourth wing here? Ah, I love it. Oh. And it's my understanding that this power of being a beast is also a telltale sign that they are the court's chosen high lord. There's a little bit of ambiguity with all of that. But yes, if you are able to turn into a beast, that's kind of like a channeling of your high lord power embodiment there. So 
to talk about this black dragon like bat creature, we do get a glimpse into Reese's beast form. It is a massive black membranous wings, a single claw at the apex of them. Favorite darling will get very familiar with these massive wings, but not the most massive. Looking at you, Asriel. I love that even here, she calls them, quote, horrific, stunning, a face of a thousand nightmares and dreams. Nightmares and dreams, indeed. Hello, Court of Nightmares and Court of Dreams foreshadowing. I love it so much. And while Farah is still like, I'm never going to paint him, she still thinks, and I quote, that again, useless part of me stirred at the sight. The way the candlelight shone through the wings, illuminating the veins, the way it bounced off his talons. Her creative juices are flowing. She might say she doesn't want to paint him, but she is starting to visualize it. She's tapping into that painter's mind during a time that she's not feeling particularly creative nude would be best <laughs> <laughs> we also get these talons for fingers and toes here we will get the full effect of reese's beast form in the final battle at akawar but here is where pharaoh learns that he doesn't like to be in this form because quote i don't particularly like yielding wholly to my baser side how much more opposite of Timmy Tam can this guy get? Tamlin, who basically entirely yields to his baser instincts, so much so that his claws punch out and bitch slap him <laughs> on a regular basis. Then even more so in Frost and Starlight and Silver Flames, when he is living solely, basically, in his beast form in the spring court alone. Rough stuff, Timmy Tam. Reese again flicks a speck of dust off of his black jacket. Again, dust watch. Here we are. We're here again. So right before he flicks this speck of dust off, Feyre asks Reese for the riddle's answer. I love that as she asks this, she thinks how it's only with him that she has trouble keeping her mouth shut. Just more mating bond foreshadowing. I love it. They're equals. And I love that she's talking back to him in a way she'd never be allowed to with Tamlin. Like she even thinks about that, like how she's not allowed to talk that way to Tamlin. And with Reese, no, they are equals. Like she feels compelled to push back with him because they are on even footing. And only after mentioning how, quote, she gives an order and we all bow to it. Does he pick that speck of dust off of his jacket followed with a, it's a good thing she likes me, isn't it? I am convinced that every time there's a subtext to this flicking of a dust off of his jacket. And my best guess for this one is to give him something to do with his hands because he's so angry at his current situation where he's just... <laughs> With two hands. Two hands, sorry. <laughs> but without grabbing Feyre's face with two hands, he instead flicks a speck of dust off of his jacket. And again, this might be like him wanting to take some control back in a control list situation. Now, going back to why he's not answering the riddle, to be clear, Reese is not able to directly give Farah the answer to the riddle, or I believe he would have offered hints in his own clever way. Like Reese says, Amarantha ordered everyone to keep their lips shut about the riddle. But alternatively, Amarantha doesn't know about their connection via the bargain tattoo. So Reese has, I'd say, more leniency with being able to help Farah in the second task. And, and who knows, maybe there had not been any specific direction about not helping her in the second task, especially since Lucian, who did help her in the first one, is not essentially able to help her now in the second one. Such a possibility is not even on Amarantha's mind that somebody would be willing to help her in the second task. Or if maybe there was that rule, Reese figures out a loophole with the bargain tattoo where it's not actually him telling her, you know, something like that. And same thing, like it's a lot easier for this, for the tattoo to be able to like metaphorically slap her hand and pick the, and pick the right lever when it wouldn't be able to offer her help in the same way with the riddle like it, the bargain tattoo can't be like hey the answer to the riddle is love you know so, so that's my head canon for how that all works there so anyway i just wanted to clear that up because we have had a lot of confusion around why reese can help during the second task but he can't help with giving the answer to the riddle and then just to wrap the scene up here of course reese is protecting farah he is taking care of her in a small but mighty way no more household chores and she's going to get real food from here on I just I laugh at myself because how did I ever think he was bad I mean I you know obviously hindsight's twenty twenty now but I know that that's how we're supposed to feel he's a bad guy because we are in Farrah's head but little things like this that he does it's just like that's really nice 
I mean, obviously, also, there's a lot of other bad things that he takes L's, but things like this, it's like, yeah, he is definitely a good guy. He also mentions how, like, you're not allowed to touch her. You are not allowed to go into yep. her cell. Like, he is really looking out for her in a way that, it, at least since we're in her head, we don't think that she is thinking. Yep. So, good job, Reese. You get a W here. It's not a lot in this episode, so we'll give it to you where we can. <laughs> so these two women, entirely made of shadow, enter Feyre's cell one night, and when they touch Feyre, she also turns into shadow, or at least like a non-corporeal version of herself. So the three of them can walk through the door. Can we pause for a second? What the fuck? This magic is so cool. These two shadow figures are Nuala and Caradwin. And are they under the mountain as well? They're just in the lower levels. Why are they shadows? How are they shadows? Do we ever get an explanation for this? Well, well, we know that they're shadows because they are half shadow wraiths, right? Yeah. And they're half fae. Now, I too, however, have lots of questions about this. If I had to guess, because they are half wraiths and how their magic works with shadows, they wouldn't be confined to those lower levels. Levels. Remember that in the lower levels is where all of the lesser fairies are essentially supposed to fend for themselves. It's really bad down there. I don't even know if they would be confined to just being under the mountain, period. And maybe Reese brought them specifically to help Feyre. Then that does raise the question about how would Reese summon them from the safety of like Valaris, because we assume that's where they would be otherwise when he's cut off from everybody. So probably yes they are under the mountain yeah. i just don't know how all of that works perhaps the twins who are you know half a half shadow wraiths couldn't take their full form like they do in the valaris something to do with the magic that's under the mountain or amarantha's hold on all of them did they accompany reese to the party 50 years ago and they were able to use their shadow magic to slip away while half of the court of nightmares was murdered like right then and there when amarantha stripped reese of his power like we do have to remember these two twins are his spies so they could have been there as his spies and continuing to serve now under the mountain continuing as his spies these past 50 years not noticed by amarantha in her court i don't know also why are they completely silent almost the whole time with vera under the mountain i'd say that they were unable to talk to her in this form but they do say a few words when they all hide from the adder and the pig-like creature so i have to assume reese commanded them not to talk to Feyre. Feyre also doesn't ask for answers very much. Like, she's not really fighting back. So sounds like nobody was really trying that hard to talk to each other, for the most part. <laughs> I really like the idea that this is, that they came to the party with Resand as kind of like his helping hands, because they are his helpers in the house. Like, they are, you know, two people who are living in the townhouse. And so that would make the most sense to me. But these two confusing creatures paint Feyre and they dress her. From the neck up, she is absolutely regal and decked out. She's got makeup. Her hair is done. Note that her hair was coiled around a small golden diadem embedded with lapis lazuli. I love that she is wearing a crown. This is already hinting at that high lady of the night court foreshadowing. But just like I did for our Onyx Storm, it's time for some gem watch again. Lapis lazuli is one of the oldest spiritual stones known to man. It is used by healers, priests, royalty for power, wisdom, and to stimulate psychic abilities and inner vision. It represents universal truth. To be honest, I have no idea if that's a like direct correlation or is it just sounds like a cool gem to have in a crown. I'm leaning towards the latter. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. And then just jumping ahead a little bit is when Feyre, she's at the party and I love how she feels the weight of the crown digging into her skull. It feels heavy and foreign right now because she's nowhere close to her high lady status yet but she still makes sure that she's able to keep her head held high but from the neck down let's talk about this because yeah. she's a quote <laughs> yeah quote, we got a lot to talk about here <laughs> <laughs> quote heathen god's plaything painting similar patterns from her tattoo except it's all over her body. I also love that it's blue black paint. It's the night sky. It's the painting of the color of the night sky. But also side note, I wonder if Nuala and Caridwin are so good at decorating cakes because they did this for two months straight of just painting flowers all over Favor's body. They got a lot of artwork <laughs> practice. Not only are they like, you know, painting her body, but they're like really painting her body. Bye. I <laughs> I personally, you know, take to mean they're painting her like she is naked, you know, with her boobies and her butt and probably her inner thigh area as well. And yeah, Feyre fights it at first because it's like, what the fuck are you doing, right? <laughs> and I'm not faulting the twins. They were under orders from Reese. But yeah, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute too. A lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> 
But yeah, it's a kind of a tough look all around for this invasion of privacy and more specifically the lack of consent. I think um, we can all fully agree on that. Yeah. But we're not done because then there's no. the heavy air quotes dress, which is two long shafts, nice, of gossamer that cover her breasts, meet in a belt to cover her front side and her backside barely. Now, I imagine that when you're walking, the flow of the gossamer kind of like ripples off, which means your ass is just constantly showing. And also she's under the mountain, so she's cold. Reese, baby, it is time for you to start taking L's again. Let's roll up our sleeves here and just start (laughs) dishing out the L's. (laughs) From the neck up, you're good. Her hair is clean. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. She's got makeup on, which, you know, it sounds like she she enjoys. Like, she's got her full hair and makeup. That shit is expensive. Good for you. Thank you. But from the neck down, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Big L. L, 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 L. My guy. Not okay. Yes. So, all jokes aside, the Akatar fandom has very strong opinions about certain aspects of the series, as we all know. And Reese's choices and behaviors under the mountain are absolutely right there at the top of this list. We will later learn that Reese had his reasons for putting Feyre through these parties, making her drink and black out, having her perform lap dances and things like that. And even though we love our High Lord of the Night Court, I cannot emphasize that enough. We do love him very much and understand why he did all of this. That does not excuse it or mean that this plan was the best or even only option. And we just have to call him out on this ick and call it what it is. One of my favorite things I saw on the internet ever, I still think about it constantly, is someone was mentioning how like it was so rude and selfish of Feyre to paint Reese's cabin and like how weird and da 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 da. And then someone in the comments was like, well, for two months, he painted her body against her will. So... You know, and I have never pressed a like button on a comment harder. I like smashed that button because yeah, it is true. Does not excuse Reese's behavior here. And I will, we'll also debate Feyre and the morals and all that kind of stuff when she, when we get to the cabin, but we're not there yet. This is not a good look, Reese. Not good. Let's quickly walk through why Reese had Feyre dressed up like a heathen God's plaything and made her the evening entertainment night after night for Amarantha's court. I know this is this is tough. It's moments <laughs> like this where I kind of get why Tamlin and Lucian at the end of Akamath were like, we're here to save the day. Like, yes. Watch this for two months. So like, I get it. <laughs> I, oh, absolutely. Like, well, and that's like, a whole other discussion about how they were justified in their thoughts. Now, again, I'm not opening up that can of worms <laughs> right now. <laughs> no, we're not talking about that. right. Now. Let's defend Reese right here and now because we do need to explain what his reasons were before we keep going. So number one, he wanted to work Tamlin into a senseless fury. He wanted Tamlin to get so consumed with rage that the moment he was freed from Amarantha's grasp, whether through the trials or the riddle, Tamlin would be driven by this fury and this need to immediately kill Amarantha. Remember that the other courts, including Reese and the Night Court, are relying on Tamlin to kill Amarantha once he is freed because only the spring court is guaranteed freedom. So only by Tamlin killing Amarantha will any of the other courts also be freed. And friends, we have to keep in mind Tamlin currently has a pretty shitty track record of helping the other courts out. So Reese's reasoning here is in order for the rest of us to be freed, Tamlin has to be so pissed off at Amarantha that he goes full man bear pig and kills her at his very first opportunity. And what is the one way to get Tamlin super worked up and extra pissed off at Amarantha? Because nothing else has worked. (laughs) Remember, he still went to a masquerade ball for Amarantha after Lucian was scarred and his eye taken out. Like, cannot forget this because he still wanted to sing Kumbaya and think that there was that chance. So the only way that will absolutely get him into the senseless fury and actually kill Amarantha is having the love of his life dangled in front of him. And he's just being taunted by all of this day in and day out. So you might be asking however wouldn't Tamlin actually want to direct his anger here at Reese instead of Amarantha because it's Reese making Feyre do all of this 
That's exactly what Feyre is wondering. Reese is willing to take the risk that Tamlin will be more angry with Amarantha because she's the reason for all of this in the first place. Even Feyre's servitude to Reese can be blamed on Amarantha, and he has been very intentional about the paint and where he touches, or rather doesn't touch, Feyre. He never touches her beyond her waist and arms, good job, and that is his one claim to innocence, his one claim to being able to explain, hey man, I didn't do this because I'm a monster, I did it because I'm a double agent who helped ensure we'll all be freed, so you're welcome. Yes, he is doing this to piss off Tamlin, and the paint is the way of proving his innocence. However, the very first time Reese sees Feyre all decked out in this paint, he runs a finger over her shoulder and it the paint immediately fixes itself. So is this really proving his point? So yes, that is a little counterintuitive. My guess is that he is showing Feyre this as a warning for her not to try to mess around with Tamlin. He's showing like, look, like, it doesn't matter like if I touch you like the paint will stay but when he goes out there when they're out in public he does make sure that the paint is smeared where it's supposed to be smeared so this is more uh, I'll say a symbolic nature of what what he's sharing with her the paint is also a warning to anyone else not only Tamlin but also the bad fairies in the court it's a warning not to mess with Reese's quote thing which by the way him saying he doesn't like his belongings tampered with oh dear Reese baby he's bad LLL. He's bad. Again, playing the bad guy. It would be really weird if he treated this human with the respect and love he wants to show her. By her quote unquote belonging to him, he is also telling all the other bad fairies to back the F off. So it is a way of protecting her by him seemingly being possessive in this way. Again, there's a lot of mind games going on here. That brings me to my second reason for Reese doing all of this. Part of him being a double agent is him purposefully making sure that Feyre hates him. His bigger game here includes Feyre believing he is the bad guy. He is willing to put on this convincing performance so it's not an act for her and further sends Tamlin into that fury because of how miserable Feyre is through all of this. Not a good look, but he's got his reasons I suppose. He's essentially saying, hey, she's no longer yours, Tamlin, which Tamlin is possessive over her. We all know that. But now she belongs to his enemy, which again, just brings us right back to point number one, which just sends Tamlin into more of a fury there. Reese also forced her to drink the wine so she wouldn't remember all the horrors of Under the Mountain. He is plagued by decades of horror, and he is trying to spare her from experiencing some of those horrors herself, especially because he is the one dragging her out from her dungeon to be here at these parties every single night. She could be, for lack of a better word, sheltered from the going-ons of Amarantha's court if she just stayed in her dungeon. But if she stays in her dungeon for the whole duration, it would be like an out-of-sight, out-of-mind for the others. And while I don't think Tamlin would forget about Feyre by any means, seeing her be paraded around night after night absolutely gets his blood boiling in a way it wouldn't if he never saw her and knew that she was, quote, safe in the dungeon. Remember, that's such a Tamlin thing to do. Huh. On that, which, oh uh, yeah, that's some serious foreshadowing there for the <laughs> next book. Oh my God, I just realized that. Yes. <laughs> On that same note, Reese knows that this bargain with Thera, this ruse with her, is a sign of hope to some in the other courts. So when he brings her to these parties and is playing his game, it's literally saying to others, look, I'm on your side and playing a bigger game here. But on the other hand, while this bargain with Thera is a sign of hope for some, it is also a way of saying to Amarantha that he's on her side because he is torturing Thera and Tamlin in his own way. Amarantha knows how much Reese and Tamlin hate each other. It's one of the reasons she brought him into her bed in the first place as a punishment for killing Tamlin's father, who is Amarantha's ally. So she sees this as, ooh, Reese is getting back at Tamlin by tormenting his human girl. So by parading Thera around like this, it's stating she's now Reese's plaything, so Amarantha's other cronies can't have dibs on Thera. He already does. Now, could Reese have possibly come up with a different plan that wasn't so cringy? Probably. I'll just call it here. Probably. We do have to keep in mind, and this is really sad, actually, he has been a sex slave for five decades. So this particular type of plan is at the forefront of his mind based on personal experience. You'd think that because he's so miserable, he wouldn't want to spare his mate, his mate, from feeling like she's enduring what he does. But I'll just say that Reese is not doing his best here. He's not doing his best strategy work here. He is a flawed character. We have to remember that, like most characters in this world. And this is a period of 
big old L's for our High Lord of the Night Court. Even if we can wrap our heads around his why, doesn't mean we agree with or approve of his choices. But I'm also not going to ultimately hold this against his character. He's at least plotting, he's playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers, and I have to give him credit for where credit is due even if he's taking a few L's in the process. Anyway, I have complicated feelings about all of this, if you can't tell. But anyway, there's the whole why he is doing this in the first place. Well, I mean, we can understand why Tamlin went to the King of Highburn to try to get Feyre back. Do we agree with it? (laughs) No. (laughs) But that's also these morally great characters. I love that they are acting within character, even though we as the reader are supposed to be like, what the fuck? Like, what are you doing? We were supposed to be questioning it. Speaking of, as they enter the throne room, they head straight for Amarantha and Tamlin. He still stays stoic somehow with no claws, which I want to just ask the question. Fucking how this guy bitch slapped himself (laughs) for no reason earlier in this book because of that immediate loss of control. He is seeing his the love of his life, or at least as, as he knows her to be right now, being paraded by his number, I'll call it number two enemy, with a tattoo from the night court. And she is like, she's wearing basically nothing. Like, how is he not turning immediately into that man bear pig mode? And not like in the physical beast mode, but like in the emotional sense. It shows that he is able to keep his emotions in check, but only in this particular only kind of in dire instance. circumstances yes i do love that in this scene jurian's eye is absolutely fixed on Feyre and reese like almost like he's like looking he's like damn dude what the fuck like he's even like this is interest like this is like like almost like his daytime tv like this is i feel like this 500 years of daytime tv poor jurian i really like he is such an unsung hero from this time poor jurian well so later in the series I, I'm, I'm going off of memory here so correct me if i'm wrong but jurian will admit that he was watching reese and knew his true motives when he was under the mountain because he saw what game reese was really playing and so when he's looking at this he's probably seen that chessboard that reese has as well versus you know just scene and taking what's straight in front of him like most other people was jurian was the ring on during amarantha and resan's that sleepy time? is a good question was he third wheeling <laughs> that's not funny nicole that's not funny i i never asked that question before. i never want to know the answer to that question i really don't <laughs> There's so many layers to this whole exchange between Reese, Feyre, Tamlin, and Amarantha. Feyre feels like a savage compared to Amarantha's cultivated beauty. She's just a human plaything in the presence of greatness. I just, I love that comparison right there, how she's a savage compared to her cultivated beauty. And how Amarantha is asking Reese what he's done with her captive. She's smiling, but it doesn't meet her eyes. She is indeed wary of what Reese is doing here, which I assume is one more reason why he makes Feyre do what he makes her do to ease amarantha's initial what the fuck are you doing thoughts and assure her that this is further humiliation and fuckery with the human girl then we have tamlin like you were saying who is doing absolutely nothing but he is i'll give him this at least he is white knuckling his throne trying to keep himself in check and this whole time reese is just playing his own game and Feyre is caught in the middle of all of this desperately trying to silently convey to tamlin that she's in this position for his sake the language of reese turning her away from tamlin and then Feyre keeping it together by holding her chin up and refusing to let her humiliation show Ah, I just want to reach through the pages and give our strong, resilient, stubborn girl a big hug. The yells aren't even near done yet, though, because Reese commands, and I'm using that word very specifically, he commands Feyre to drink the fairy wine, the wine that he knows will make her blackout and also super hungover the next day. Making her blackout every single night is one thing, but then totally just making her feel like she can't even stand up straight without vomiting the next day. That would be what pisses me off more. It's like, I'm trying to figure out this riddle. I need to be training for these freaking trials and you're fucking over my plan. Like I would be so mad if I was favor right now. All of Reese's L's, we do get reasoning for in chapter 54. Lexi laid them out here earlier. And we learned that this is because he doesn't want her to remember what's happening. 
but he made that decision for her. We called out Lucian and Tamlin earlier this book for making decisions on behalf of Feyre and not giving her the autonomy over her own life and her own decisions. This is Reese doing that too. L. Big L, my guy. Yeah, I I feel like he could have avoided this big L by explaining why. And remember, when he when we say commanding her to drink it, he is literally with his magic forcing her to drink it. It's not that is what we mean here. So if he explained why, where it was like, you are not going to want to see what's going on here. I really recommend you drink this for your own sake. I don't know if she would have said yes, probably not because she is stubborn like that. And as I think about it, I also have to realize that probably would have put his bigger plan at risk yeah. as he does play the double agent. Yeah, again, we understand why he's doing it. I don't necessarily have a better alternative, but that doesn't mean we're not going to still give you an L. <laughs> But someone who doesn't get an L this stretch of chapters is Lucian. We got to give Lucian one big gold star. I think he actually might be the only character taking a gold star this entire stretch of chapters. Well, hold on. I also gave the people who figured out the riddle a gold star too. So our listeners okay, who, okay. who got That's the riddle. <laughs> so we get two people getting gold stars today or two groups of people. Lucian walks into the cell and immediately takes his cloak off and puts it around Feyre. Now later he like makes a pokey pokey and he's like, I've seen enough of you to like last me a lifetime huh? which is like it's not very kind but anyway but he immediately wants to make sure she feels warm because she is freezing and hung over and just oh god poor Feyre so quick pause here because I have a question about this cloak Lucian swiped it off of a dozing guard which Nasia is that you hello <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it took you a second <laughs> i was like who the fuck iron flame is deep, <laughs> iron flame deep plug there and there is an embroidered symbol on it which is amarantha's coat of arms you know what her coat of arms is it is a sleeping dragon does this mean that dragons technically exist in the akatar world there is not a single other mention yes i checked all five of the books here not a single other mention of dragons in this entire series but i love how the signature fantasy creature finds itself so briefly in our story right here and it makes me wonder did highburn have dragons that we don't know about like another series with wyverns anyways probably irrelevant but i just had to point this out also i just have to say i was initially surprised that amaranthus coat of arms is a sleeping dragon dragon yes that doesn't surprise me at all but sleeping and then i thought about it and was like oh that actually is quite fitting because it goes along with her nickname which is the deceiver she is deceivingly passive and harmless and charming but nope, she is dangerous and fierce and you don't want to mess with her. I also find it interesting that it is dragon in this series versus a different species of dragon in other series. So there better be four legs on that thing. There better be four <laughs> legs or else I'm out. <laughs> then Feyre, poor fucking Feyre, starts to inquire about the previous night. She pushes Lucian to tell her exactly what happened, even though he really doesn't want to be the bearer of that news. She danced for Resand all night long, and when she wasn't dancing, she was sitting in his lap. The, the innuendo there is the lap dance. Feyre asks Lucian, quote, in front of everyone. I have also asked a friend this question that like, oh God, in front of everyone after a night of a little too much indulgence. This is never the question you want to be asking the next day ever. That is just instant like shame and embarrassment spiral. Yeah. Never fun. Oh God, I'm, all I'll say is this brings me back to a lot of morning after memories and feelings that I don't care to revisit as I have grown up now. <laughs> and at least those I did to myself. I was in my own driver's seat. Like here, she's yes. not. She's not in her own control. And again, big L for Reese, my guy. We need to start. To, I've, I've totally lost count. I feel like- Yeah, well, I think we've said a lot this episode. <laughs> But Feyre asks if Tamlin was roused from beholding this spectacle. And shockingly, the answer is no. Tamlin, I bet anything. He even looked away the whole night so that he was not forced to watch and therefore break. I'm going to go off on Tamlin next episode, specifically in chapter 42. I like got like heated last night working on that part of the outline. I was so pissed. <laughs> and like, I'm so pissed about this. But also, I also like note that I did not think twice about his actions under the mountain on my first read. 
I absolutely agree with you, but I am going to ask you the question and I'll ask our listeners this question too. What do you think he should have done or how should he have reacted instead? Talk to reset, like resand. How can we be allies here? How can I know? Cause but Amarantha not- has him under her thumb where he can't make a single yeah. move without her knowing. I mean, could he have asked Lucian to do, uh, like, everything else he does? He has the Lucian that to do it That is a good for. point, yeah. But, like, the big thing is ally with other people. Do whatever he can to figure out if he even, like, can help and assist and like is there a bigger mission at play okay also I'm, i am jumping a little bit ahead here but i do think it's important to call out in chapter 42 the one of the reasons i think he takes her to the closet to like have that moment with her and he only says i love you as like a parting words he's saying goodbye to her he does not yes. believe she's going to yes. last the three trials so you know what you could have done tamlin fucking believe in your girl that's what you could have done tamlin fucking support her and believe in her like even if it's just making eye contact with her she's fighting for you at least give her some kind of like eye contact of he, he i'm does fighting that, for you though too. he does he no, does do that with vacant. eyes wide and full of love and i can't believe you're making me defend tamlin again under the mountain Why does he have eyes full of love looking at her it happens multiple times in this stretch I do not remember this in the slightest, but I might have been looking at it through a certain color of glasses. <laughs> my, my big thing is he could have supported her and believed in her. And that like that is what he could have done. I will accept that answer. Yes, because I personally don't have an answer of how he could have reacted differently in front of Farah. The thing that gets me is that now in hindsight, we know he was not planning behind all of that simmering anger. So I'm not necessarily mad at him for showing no reaction in the moments here, but I'm absolutely mad at him for this being his only strategy yeah. and plan. It's so in character for Tamlin because he is not a schemer. We already know this about him. Again, Reese can't trust Hamlin to scheme to free everyone after the Supreme Court is freed. That's the main reason he's doing all of this is to work him into a frenzy and manipulate Hamlin into taking action to free everyone else because he would not have planned it on his own. We're all That's- in agreement there, I think. <laughs> yes. And even then, the plan is relying on his anger issues to save the day. Not his smarts, but on the beast roaring to come out. That's my whole thing. I'm not mad at him for him not having any reactions in the moment because I I can understand that play. But it is the fact that that is his only strategy and nobody else can rely on him to help free the other courts. So this is why Reese is having this whole plan in the first place. I'm still mad at him for not supporting and believing in Pharaoh when we say Oh, I believe you. (laughs) I'm so mad at him for that. Speaking of Tamlin, because we're not done, <laughs> Feyre does ask if he's all right under the spell that Amarantha has him under, and da 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 da. And Lucian's like, what spell? What spell? There's no spell. Like, what are you talking about, human? Human? Quote, hasn't it occurred to you that Tamlin is keeping quiet to avoid telling Amarantha which form of torment affects him most? Look, I get this as like, again, a surface level plan for Tamlin being a fucking vegetable. But with this logic, wouldn't Amarantha torture Feyre more and more and more to see how far she can push Tamlin before he finally breaks? Wouldn't she then make this a game for herself to figure out what she can do to finally break Tamlin? Why is he still committing to this bit? This is ridiculous. Even Lucian thinks that he's playing, quote, a dangerous game. For the next night's favorite is dressed, painted, fairy wine gets drugged. But each time she enters the throne room, she gets at least one glimpse of Tamlin and she doesn't fight to hide the love and pain that she shows to him again she is le- she has her heart on a fucking sleeve with him right now she gets one glimpse just one glimpse and she shows more bravery than tamlin does the entire time he's under the fucking mountain i'm pissed at tamlin right now. everybody we, we might have a few more f-bombs this episode so <laughs> <laughs> I'm mad. (laughs) Tamlin may have his reasons for his inactions, which Lucian lays out for us. And we are like, oh, yeah, that's right on our first read. But throughout her time under the mountain, Thera's narration about Tamlin is ever so slightly shifting, even if her heart is still all, I love him with everything I have. 
We talked a little last episode about how she's subconsciously angry that he, quote, let them do many awful things. And earlier in the stretch of chapters, she thinks to herself that she knows better than to wish for Tamlin. Does she still love him? Of course she does. She shows that until the very, very end of this book, how much she loves him. But she's holding on to what was, which directly conflicts with the reality she's in now. It's the beginning of the end for them as we're in Thera's head, recognizing there's hopelessness and frustration with Tamlin. She knows that she can't rely on him to be there for her when she needs it most. But Nicole, you know who is there for her? Resand, we later learn, is the one who's actually <laughs> there for her this entire but time. he is and even in these things. moments, too. She has yeah. moments where she's relying on him to protect her, and he comes through every single time. Maurice, baby. Favorite is getting all dolled up one night, and Reese comes in to let her know that her second task is tomorrow. But she's getting all feisty as he mentions if Tamlin were a true high lord, his court wouldn't have fallen. And Favorite mentions how his, Rizan's court fell too. Quote, sadness flickered in those violet eyes. I wouldn't have noticed it if I had not, dot, 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 felt it deep inside me. What manner of tattoo exactly had he given me? Sadness, yes, he misses his court of dreams, but also hello mind to mind bond opening up, especially right before the second task where he uses that bond to direct her towards the correct answer. God, I love it. (laughs) Feyre has no idea how much she just burned him. Like, yes, the court of nightmares fell and he had sacrificed his own fall and the court of nightmares fall to protect the court of dreams. And he just misses his home so, so, so terribly and his friends and all that he loved. I'm going to give Reese the benefit of the doubt on this as well. He is desperate. So he is going to like extreme lengths in order to ensure that his masterminding is going to work. So are his plans morally good? No, they're morally gray, just like he is. But he is a desperate man trying to get back to his family. So not excusing in any way. But that is also another thing for Reese. As these two walk into the throne room, though, we immediately know that something is wrong. Especially because Lucian's brothers are all too happy for anything good to be happening right now. Like when you see that they're excited, it's like, oh, this is bad. Feyre notes that she's not too proud to ask Reese not to leave her alone with them. But it's like he already knows that would be a bad, bad, bad idea. And he keeps her at his side. And like we were just saying there with Reese, he is protecting her. She's turning to him for that protection in this moment. And she knows that she's safest at his side. And he, without her even having to ask him, he knows that too and he keeps her by his side there. Amarantha has a member of the summer court before her who tried to escape. And she asks Reese to look into his mind, figure out why. We have obviously, obviously given Reese a lot of L's and we will continue doing so later. But here is one of his few wins. He mentions how the fairy was working alone and planned to run for the human realm. This is obviously a lie as we learn from looking over through Vera's eyes, looking at the uh, High Lord of the Summer Court, which we will know is Tarquin later. He's like, oh, thank God, like there were more people or more fairies who were in on this plan. And I bet you anything Tarquin was one of them as well. Again, Tarquin making money moves. He is a high lord. He is under Amarantha's watchful eye, not as much as Tamlin, but he's at least making money moves. And he's also the youngest. Go Tarquin. (laughs) Now furious with Amarantha for having to kill for her again. Resand melts this fairy's brain, which I guess is better than shattering his mind. I need to know the differences of those magics. Okay, so so imagine by shattering his mind, he would then become a shell of a person. It's exactly like a dementor sucking out your soul. It's Got worse it. than okay. death. And then if he gives him just a quick instantaneous death, then most people would prefer that than living as a husk of a person without your soul there. I would actually argue that Reese's disobedience here isn't so much a reflection on his anger that he has to kill, but rather it's a message to Tarquin. This compassionate kill helped Tarquin understand Reese is not just Amarantha's crony because he's literally saving Tarquin's life. This was a way for Reese to say to Tarquin, I'm with you, buddy. I'm with you, even though he still has to, you know, kill his cousin, which I I will get into like the specifics of that here in a few moments. Some of the fairies afterward will give him tentative, appreciative smiles and words, good that you killed him. And while this could all be read as them thinking Summer Court is indeed a traitor and Reese did the right thing being on Amarantha's side, those tentative and appreciative smiles might be conveying something else, where they recognize this is a mercy kill and they sympathize with Reese in the moment, even if their words saying that, you know, good on you, 
convey something else. And of course, to your point there, he is absolutely pissed off at his circumstances. Well, speaking of being pissed off, he leaves Amarantha's like beck and call without being dismissed. This is really highlighting, I think, how pissed he is that he's in this position. He hates the life that he is currently living for the last 50 years. He, we get in Mist and Fury how much he hates that he had to kill for her over and over again. He might not feel helpless by any means because he does have plans working for him, but he's angry at his situation. Absolutely. And then SJM really drives us home when he joins Feyre in drinking the wine. That one line of show don't tell says so much about how he feels about his predicament. We will learn later what really occurred in this scene. So let's recap this from Tarquin and Reese's POV. Brutus is the name of this high fae who was caught trying to escape through the cave that led to the spring court. Tarquin had forces gathering in all their summer court cities, planning to storm under the mountain. Like Nicole said, good for you, Tarquin. We love you. Brutus was supposed to escape through the tunnels to meet up with them. And Reese, he saw all of this in his mind, but Reese defied Amarantha anyway. And even though Tarquin is young and inexperienced, he understood that Reese spared him and more of his court, which prompted him to later admit in Akamath, quote, sometimes I think Resand dot dot dot, I think he might have been her Amarantha's whore to spare us all from her full attention. And this was one of the reasons that Tarquin decided to let them into their summer home to to bring them to host them and to really see what Reese is all about so that he could get a real good judge on his character outside of Under the Mountain. I think actually Tarquin might be the best High Lord of all of them. I think I absolutely yeah. agree. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love him so much, Tarquin's and he, he is he's such a, he's a dreamer too, and I just love him. Oh, I also want to point out really quickly: Claire's body is still nailed <laughs> to this wall. <laughs> it awesome. has been over a month. This girl, her body, her rotting corpse, must smell so bad, and all of these fairies are just not saying anything i am convinced there has to be some kind of magic basking the smell because or else that would be horrendous for these fae who have these heightened senses of smell or their nose hairs are just completely gone and their sense of smell is dead (laughs) you're so hung up on this i'm so hung up on this well you know claire might not be doing any better but you know what can help your small business do better your website websites are an essential first impression to create a memorable customer experience and that's why we're really excited this podcast is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place, all on your terms. I've been designing websites for about four years now. I love how easy Squarespace Blueprint lets you start a completely personalized website and choose from professionally curated layouts and styling options to build a unique online presence from the ground up. Easily launch your website and get discovered fast with integrated, optimized SEO tools so you show up more often to more people and grow the way you want. And for all of our fantasy fangirls out there who are selling their own products, hello! Squarespace's client invoicing allows you to easily manage your clients and invoices so you're receiving payment via invoices in one streamlined and customizable workflow, which is a huzzah. Squarespace can really work for anyone. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash FFG to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much, Squarespace. All right, friends, we are on to the second task. Like I mentioned, as we started discussing the first task, each of these tasks reflect an aspect of Thera's book one journey, not done on purpose by Amarantha, but more symbolically done by SJM. So the second task highlights one of her biggest insecurities. She needs to be able to read, even to have a chance at completing this challenge, and she's self-consciously illiterate. She doesn't overcome this in the same way she did with the first task, which was playing into her survival skills that she already had, but rather it's a lesson in hopelessness and her own inability to save herself. Ironically, it is Resand who saves her and helps her overcome this challenge. Not her survival skills, not her determination, and especially not her love for Tamlin. (laughs) In fact, I love how she chooses two. Two for her and Tamlin. But that's not the answer. She even thinks that three is too many. Three equates to three sisters cramped in a home together. 
But guess what three also represents? Three bat boys, three females in the inner circle, her, Amran, and more. Three friends who become family for Nesta. Three means two parents and a little baby Nix. Three means community. Three means family. Three means connection with others and relying on them, loving them, and accepting their love back. And what do you know, friends? Three is the answer here. Not two like her and Tamlin, but three like a family. Chills. Who else just got chills there? I did. Fuck, Lexi. Jesus. <laughs> Way to go. Oh, that's There's my so- AP lit at work right there. <laughs> there you go. Not going to lie. When I was reading this for the first time, I was really shocked that Amarantha gave her a multiple choice question with only three answers. That's pretty generous, especially <laughs> given the fact that she didn't know Pharaoh was illiterate. Even Amarantha is- mentions how it's so generous of her to do that. And I'm I don't agree with Amarantha often, (laughs) but I do right now. Now, looking back, I do think it's because she wanted to, quite frankly, ensure that Feyre made it to the final task so that she could utterly destroy her. This is always the task that is kind of glazed over in this story. And to be honest, for good reason, because it is one of the ones like you think about going up against a Midgard worm and that's fucking terrifying. You think about stabbing three people in the heart. That's not a good look, but like pulling a lever, like pull the lever, crunk. This is definitely one of the easier challenges. I'm ignoring the spikes. I was just going to say the the spikes coming down is a little terrifying in and of itself, but you know, she has to do something, but still of the three, this is definitely definitely the one with the the highest mortality rate I feel like would come out of this one I guess <laughs> <laughs> all things considered I agree that she does take it easy on Farah, not just in this one with the multiple choice only because there are three multiple choice answers that is the only reason we are saying she's taking yeah. it easy on Farah in this instance but I will also argue that she's taking it fairly easy on her throughout these three months knowing what she is capable of i think that amarantha is really taking it easy on Farah throughout these three months here again she likes to play with her food of course i also imagine whatever the riddle was here for Farah to solve would have been difficult amarantha has her own opinions about humans and how stupid they are so she may be like ha 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 well if she can't get one riddle then she probably won't get this one either which by the way i looked high and low for a real riddle this second task might be referring to with the three grasshoppers and here is the only bit of information that i could find i did some real deep diving here there is an english poem by sir henry john newbolt called really be real and in it there are four grasshoppers who are in a band trying to play for some fairies there is a children's tune based on this poem changing the four grasshoppers into three now how would that turn into a riddle i don't know but that is what i found there so there you go <laughs> One last note here about Amarantha. How dare she say Farah, darling? I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to step on up onto my high horse here because I have some real issues with this. <clears throat> Doing a quick search of my ebook, Reese says darling first when he interrupts lunch in the dining room. He says, it's darling lady about the lady of the autumn court. Then Amarantha uses it for darling Claire and darling Jurian, as Nicole mentioned earlier. Then Reese says it for the first time directly to Farah when she is cleaning the lentils out of his fireplace. As wonderful as it is to see you, Farah, darling. Then Amarantha calls her darling here and one more time. So... Uh, I'm not going to lie here, friends. I don't like that she and Reese both say darling. It loses its magnificent luster a little bit. Oh, I can't even believe I'm saying that. I don't like saying that. With the signature way that Reese uses it for Farah. My question is like, because he's going to continue using it throughout the rest of the series. Is that almost him saying, this is my thing. This is something Amarantha cannot take away from me. Like, this is my word, Amarantha. You can't take this away. But like the meaning behind it. The, yeah. Like, that's the only way I can go about it. But the fact that it's never addressed is a little like eyebrow raise. Yes, I will go with that as well, where he is taking control back of his favorite word, because otherwise (laughs) I can't think much about it. (laughs) and It just makes me mad. Before Farah begins the task, she and Tamlin are caught looking at each other. See, here's one of those instances, Nicole, causing the entire cavern to be silent and Amarantha to snap. Begin. And I love how Farah locks her gaze with his again to keep herself steady as she's lowered into the second task. Is it mentioned that he looks at her with love, though? There's a A few instances where it is hinted that he is looking at her with logging with love or something along those lines. I don't know if it's that exact word, but it's synonyms to show don't tell, I think. I like (laughs) refuse to believe this. So 
Quote, but I dared a glance at my high Lord and I found his eyes hard upon me. If I could just hold him, feel his skin just for a second, for a moment, smell him, hear him say my name. That's it. But he's still looking at her hard. So I'm going to equate that yeah, to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I don't think looking at her hard means looking at her. Like, it's not tenderly. It's not in, uh, affectionately. It's Feyre. Like, it's looking at her like, don't die. <laughs> Instead of like, I care for you. I love you. I support you. I believe in you. Okay, That's so maybe different. not that instance, but I think that there are a few other ones. I will have to get obliterated and get an egg on your face. <laughs> Don't worry, you and the internet will absolutely point out if I'm wrong. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, back to walking through the second task. Feyre is lowered into a large rectangular pit made of smooth stone, making it impossible to climb out. So, okay, so she's lowered into a large rectangular pit. Got it. And she can't escape it. This pit is divided into two by an iron gate. And on the other side of this iron gate, Lucian is chained to the center of the floor. So Feyre cannot get to him whatever she tries not too high above them there are two giant spike encrusted grates glowing red with heat and they are slowly being lowered into this pit which is really really bad on one of these chamber walls there is a long inscription carved into the stone that's the riddle and beneath it are these three stone levers with the numbers one two and three engraved on them and so that is what Thera has to do she has to read and solve the riddle before these iron hot spikes come down and squish them like grapes and she has to pull the correct lever to stop these spike grates from coming down on them we have to take a minute and look at the scene in Lucian's POV. He still does not know that Feyre is illiterate unless Tamlin told him, but I don't think he did. So he were just, <laughs> so he's just watching this girl stand frozen and he's like, we're doomed. We are absolutely doomed. I'm never going to live through this. She still has about a body length of space between her and the greats. When she thinks she might have to just start saying goodbye, her, her goodbyes to Tamlin. Like, that's how much Feyre is just giving up. And Lucian is over there like, just pull a fucking lever. It doesn't matter. Like, just try. Like, fight. Do whatever you can. <laughs> to your point earlier, Lex, it does really highlight how Feyre feels utterly helpless. And in, in this particular insecurity, especially. But meanwhile, Lucian is like, oh my God, this is how I fucking die? Are you serious? This is how? I'm honestly surprised. I want to take two seconds to just highlight this. How does he not have more on the page trauma in book two when he is the go-to torture guy for Tamlin and Feyre to get them to talk? Poor yeah. Lucian. I want, Poor Lucian. I, want, I want more for him. I want him to have his happily ever after so badly. I don't care who it's with. Just give this poor male something or someone to bring him joy. Please. As Feyre reaches for the second lever, a blinding pain shoots down her hand and she looks at the tattoo and the eye narrows, which I love that this tattoo can move. Like, that's just so cool. I love it. I love the magic here. This is a huge moment for Reese. And actually, after reading this chapter, I started because I'm like, you know, telling Brett the entirety of the story every night. And he just like very lovingly sits and lis listens to me, like divulge him an entire story that he knows nothing about at the time. But I started calling Reese the Snape character after this scene because of his ulterior motives, even though we didn't know them yet, or at least even though I didn't know them yet. But given the fact that he's going out on a limb, he, Reese, is going out on a limb to save her, she just stares at her palm and it's like, be a little more subtle, Feyre. <laughs> like, okay, I, I would probably do the same because this would be quite a shocking discovery that your tattoo can do this. Like, it'd really throw you <laughs> off a little bit when you're already in a somewhat panicky situation. But this is also a tattoo she got from Reese. It is in the night court, like, swirls and whirls. It is the night court tattoo. It literally has Reese Anne's, like, feline like symbolism eye on it. And she's just like, what just happened? And if I was Amarantha, I'd be like, what just happened, Reese? <laughs> like, I would start asking questions. Now, I do have to roast Feyre a little more here for a second. Um, oh, the poor girl's about to get squished <laughs> like a grape. What are you doing? <laughs> the flaming iron gate is roughly about four feet above her head. And she, after testing all of these levers to see, like, does this one hurt? Does this one hurt? She experiences pain at two of them and none on the third one. She goes back again <laughs> does them all again just to ensure like the spikes are so close to her head and she's like 
I've got time. I can still do another test. Like, girl, come on, have some urgency. Meanwhile, Lucian is like, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. I agree with you that she is indeed frozen, but I will also point out that she does not trust Reese at this point. He is a villain in her eyes. So the fact that she is having to place her trust in him here is a really, really big deal for her. And she's going to have some hesitancy when it comes to that. Also, I just have to say, too, like, you're so in the moment during the scene with Feyre that he is making her unable to think straight. She's panicking. So she's taking a little longer to register what is going on while also combating her instinct not to trust Reese. So that's my okay. defense of her. I will accept that defense. It is a valid defense. I still think it's funny, though. <laughs> I still think it's quite funny. However, you would think that after defeating two of Amarantha's tasks, Feyre would be like a huzzah, huzzah, huzzah moment. But she's not. She starts to crumble. And it's moments like this why I love SJM books. Despite winning the second task, despite being one step closer to going to her supposed home with Tamlin, Feyre begins to completely shatter. This feels so human and so real. She's not focused on her victory. She's focusing on a blatant insecurity, almost killing her and her friend. But this different hopelessness feels very at odds of what we've seen from Feyre, especially at the beginning of this book. She was hopeless then, but she was in survival mode hopeless. She did whatever it took to put one foot in front of the other for her family. Was she optimistic? No, but she fought. This is defeated hopelessness that we see here on this in the stretch of chapters but this moment before she completely breaks we get our first mind to mind speak with three sand you wouldn't think i'd get so hyped up when we're talking about our girl crumbling he says quote don't let her see you cry put your hands at your sides and stand up don't give her the satisfaction of seeing you break reese has been under the mountain for 50 years and he has perfected this exact type of body language over over those 50 years. I guarantee you this was a similar pep talk that he had to give himself during his first stretch under the mountain, so much so that now it's just second nature to him or uh, habitual. I'll say habitual instead. And he knows Amarantha and how the best weapon Feyre has against her is her strength. If Amarantha sees that her games are working, Feyre won't stand a chance. All Feyre has control over is how she holds herself. Her inability to break against Amarantha's attempts is her greatest weapon against this Fey queen. Reese is here to remind her of that. It's also so, so, so appropriate that he is the one to help her in this moment. And of course, with the music in her cell later. He believes that she will break this hold on Amarantha and save Prithian. He believes in his girl. What a fucking concept. He has hope for this human girl and he sees it as his responsibility to keep her from breaking. Again, Rhysan taking on something as his responsibility. Go freaking figure. But this is all having to be done without blowing his cover. It is slightly at odds with his actions before this because he drugged her and he humiliated her every single night up until now for at least a little stretch of time. But we're not talking about that right now. We're defending Reese Ann. But I also want to point out that we get a good girl here from Reese. I should have known right there that this was going to be our love interest. I should have known. I also <laughs> want to shout out the writing here. Quote, now walk away, turn on your heel. Good. Walk towards the door. I love that this is such a small thing, but I love that turn on your heel. Good. It's like the sentence doesn't even finish before he's narrating that she did exactly what he told her to do. Now, it didn't narrate it for us in like a, I followed his words and turned on my heel. It shows how unconsciously she is following his I'm not even going to say orders, his guide, his guidance here. And she's trusting him so much in this moment that she's not even narrating for herself. She's just blindly following him in this moment. Now, right after she turns on her heel and leaves, Feyre breaks in her cell. And this is such a relatable moment. Maybe we haven't gone up against a fairy queen. Maybe we haven't had a near-death experience from our lack of being able to read or lack of a skill. But almost everyone has had a moment of feeling lost hopeless and in a dark place. Yes, we read stories to escape into worlds with dragons and bat boys. Oh my. But we also read these stories to feel seen and go on these emotional journeys with characters and have our emotions almost validated through them. And seeing emotions that you felt fully expressed into words is such an emotional experience in and of itself that is, it's hard to duplicate. You know, we feel these feelings, we go through our lives, but to see it 
it's like when someone finally speaks out loud what you've been feeling and you're like, oh, yes, that's it. That's it right there. This is not Favor's darkest hour yet, unfortunately. But the fact that she is breaking down, we see these common words come up that have been triggers for her throughout this entire book. For instance, ignorant human fool or my shortcomings. That word that Tamlin, her love, the one that she's fighting for, said to her, it's now coming up in this moment of insecurity and darkness. She will later go on to think about how she's only fighting for decades, which is so at odds with these immortal high fae. And to think about how meaningless those decades are to these fairies in the long run. She's accepted her fate and that she is meaningless, that she will die and that she will fail. So... Sure, she'll drink the fairy wine. She'll go through the motions, knowing it's one day closer to her death. She'll stop thinking of color, stop thinking of Tamlin's eyes, knowing there's no point in thinking about what she could paint because she'll never get the chance again. Even when she does later get the chance to paint in the not-so-distant future, she can't. Her trauma and mental health block her ability to paint. Ugh, just the despair emitting off these pages. It breaks my heart for Feyre because, like you said, we can all relate in our own unique way. I want to go back to this moment because Resand does walk in and I've got my first piece of dating advice for Resand. Can you believe this is my first piece of dating advice? <laughs> I'm actually kind of surprised in myself because Reese, my dude, two things. I've actually got two pieces of dating advice. One, never, ever ever tell someone that their tears are unnecessary. <laughs> this is like when you're stressed and they're like, oh, no need to be stressed. It's like, really, Susan? Thank God you said that. I'm cured now. Thank you. My anxiety is gone. <laughs> wild. Dang, you really got it out for Susan there, huh? <laughs> Listen, Susan and I have beef. <laughs> and then when she weeps harder, he laughs. Oh, Dude. Reese. Reese. Again, we know you're playing the nonchalant mystery bad boy with his own agenda right now. But that's not funny. So I'm giving you another bees bad. <laughs> my bees bad is what I say to my dog, by the way. I'm, bees bad. <laughs> what does bees bad mean? It's something I caught on from my in-laws and we say it to the dog and now I'm saying it to Reese Ann. <laughs> Bees bad. Got it. Now, it, I should note for people, it's not B-E-E-S. Like, it's not the, like, Cards Against Humanity card that's like, bees. It's not that <laughs> card. It's bees, B-E-Z-E. -E. Say that five times fast. My second piece of dating advice for Resand is don't lick her tears away. <laughs> don't do that. And then he, quote, has his tongue dance along the edges of her lashes. Like, I just see, like, la, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> I know he did it as a way to shock her out of her despair and it worked. So I guess good on you, but weird, <laughs> just weird, dude. Like, don't do that. I love that Feyre is like, that's disgusting. And Reese is like, I could have sworn I detected something different. That is their mating bond. Yes. And she describes this feeling as quote, going taut and loose at the same time. We will see that sentence just like that in the throne scene and in the one bed at the inn scene next book two scenes that do are my favorites <laughs> <laughs> in chapter 29 of akamath speaking of pharaoh refers back to this moment when she and reese are writing each other notes and flirting oh just there i love that part of there she writes to him quote let's hope my licking is better than yours i remember how horrible you were at it under the mountain and then she goes on to think not say to him but think quote lie he licked away my tears when i'd been a moment away from shattering he done it to keep me distracted keep me angry because anger was better than feeling nothing because anger and hatred were the long lasting field in the endless darkness of my despair the same way that music had kept me from breaking so now with that full context reese licks her tears away as a mean to fan the flames to keep her going these two are so similar he knows that anger and hatred will pull her out of the slump and help her put one foot in front of the other so we have to ask again are his methods the most most gentlemanly no, and we're not saying that. We're not condoning his behavior. And yet, it is ultimately for Farah to keep her from breaking. I feel um, like this entire stretch is Reese bad, but also... <laughs> yeah, that's exactly this whole episode. <laughs> I'm so conflicted. <laughs> she, she recognizes what he's really doing here very soon after he leaves, wondering if he knew he had just kept her from shattering completely. And the answer is yes. Yes, he did know. And that is why he did it. I love that line of thinking of, I wonder if he knew. 
it really shows they are equals. They're not the same person. They are two different people, but they think along very similar lines. They scheme very similarly. And even now, Feyre as a human, she's learning about how to tap into her inner scheming. And Reese is very much along those same lines. Scheming, inner scheming. <laughs> I love it. Speaking of scheming, we've got a scene of eavesdropping on the adder. Now, I'm not going to lie. This scene with Nuala, Caridwin, and Feyre, where they overhear the sneaky conversation with adder and the pig mouth fairy or the pig sounding like fairy, I, I never remember this scene. This is always a scene where I reread it and I'm, it just goes straight over my head. So let's do a quick recap of what these three ladies overhear on their way to paint Feyre one night. The King of Hybrid's forces are ready at last, and this will be good news for Amarantha. But Hybron's messenger raises concern that the High Lords won't contribute their forces, to which the Adder assures him that yes, the High Lords will because they do what Amarantha tells them. There's rumors among Hybron's soldiers that the King of Hybron is not happy with Amarantha and this fool's bargain with Feyre. Don't forget that 500 years ago, Amarantha's obsession with revenge on Jurian cost Hybron the war because she was too preoccupied with torturing him to come to Hybron's aid when he needed Amarantha and her forces most. Most. So if Amarantha doesn't follow orders from Hybern this time, he's going to be pissed. I get it. Apparently, he doesn't care if she steals the spells and takes Perithian for her own, but he draws a line at failing to come to his aid a second time. Again, I get it. From this conversation, we understand that it's almost time for hmm, something. Later, we will know that the something is the King of Hybern using the cauldron to bring down the wall and start another war. Hybern is relying on Amarantha and the power and forces of the Seven High Lords to come to his cause. Well, one thing I want to note here. He does not have the feet of the cauldron yet, or at least all of the feet. The attack on Caesar has not happened yet, and that's where he obtains one of the feet of the cauldron. So almost time for something is in like fey time, which is like maybe in the next 50 years we'll be ready to go, you know? It happens within what the next six months. It does. I think it does. Yeah, it yeah. So it, so it's very soon, yeah. <laughs> so one thing I didn't pick up until this read is that this pig-like creature is sent here as a messenger, and because at, he's a messenger, he he is under immunity protection from Highburn. So he is basically here to just spill the deets and then yeet back to Highburn is what I've gathered, right? I think that he's a representative. He's an emissary. He's a messenger kind of all rolled up into yeah. one here. He is here to convey information to work with them, plot with them, and then head back to Highburn. And, and you're right. He is here on immunity because that's what messengers and embassies are supposed to have. I do love that he calls the King of Highburn, quote, High King. It immediately shows us as readers where his true allegiances lie. But we also learn from this exchange that the Adder, who is definitely more in Amarantha's service than this pig-like creature, but he is playing to both sides here. That way that no matter who comes out on top, Amarantha or the King of Highburn, he will be in their good graces and be able to play the next role that he needs to play in this war. But what I love hearing in the scene is the foreshadowing that Amarantha is not our big bad of this story, which again... I totally missed on every read before this reread, so good job on me. But the King of Highburn is all over the story from meeting the Surreal for the first time, despite not being on the actual pages until literally the last 50 pages of Akamath. It's amazing how much he looms over the story. Quote, she'll soon remember who can strip her away of her powers without any spells or potions. This guy is bad. We're seeing how absolutely all powerful he is so this is a dun 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 moment it's also like oh dang amaranth is only the level <laughs> one boss <laughs> that's terrifying it actually is very in line with her character i'll say that she is more of a passive big villain versus some of the other villains that we do get here so i'm so excited but yeah she is technically a level one <sighs> boss also total side note but the twins do say a few words to pharaoh here so as we were discussing earlier they can talk under the mountain they just don't which which again, I'm assuming that Reese said to them, don't talk to her. Don't give her any reason to suspect. Just keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Because they do come to be a ally, a friendship. They do come to have a kinship. And even Elaine, especially of the three Archeron sisters, comes to be very close with Nuala and Caridwin as our story progresses. Oh, yeah. As the story yeah. progresses. Yes, definitely. All right. We are now at one of the parts everyone has been waiting for. The music in the cell. Oh. 
this part is just so beautiful and even more so on a reread knowing it was Reese who sent her this music from Volaris the court of dreams quote I was so used to the strange fiddles and drums of the fairies that when I heard the lilting melody I thought it was another hallucination sometimes if I stared at the ceiling long enough it became the vast expanse of the starry night sky and I became a small unimportant thing that blew away in the wind oh writing god oh so gorgeous Oh, yeah. <laughs> the fact that she says, quote, strange fiddles is not an accident here. Fiddles is a regularly used instrument under the mountain. Again, another tie in that, hey, maybe be a little aware of this guy, Timmy Tam here, who is known for playing the fiddle. Feyre has sunk so far into darkness. And while I know she was referring to the off kilter music of the throne room here, the subtext that even the cheery nature of the spring court music feels foreign is very much on the page here. Remember that the night sky has has always been calming to Feyre. So her seeing the night sky is going toward something that brings her back to life. Even though the music seems to be coming from the small vent in her ceiling, it is clearer when she closes her eyes because of her bond with Reese, because it's truly coming from within her and not from outside herself. She thinks how this music feels like a grand painting. Earlier in this chapter, Feyre mentions how she has stopped thinking about color and all the things that she's wanted to paint. The fact that in such a dark space, I know I keep saying that, but we cannot emphasize that enough. Feyre's in a bad place, y'all. Feyre is able to think of something as inspiring as a grand painting. She's not thinking about herself painting. She's thinking about something almost in a museum as like something, a grand spectacle. It really shows how much she needed this aid from Reese. The descriptions in the scene are just so poetic how they awaken her. Quote, the music built a path, an ascent founded upon archways of color. I followed it, walking out of that cell through layers of earth up and up. Ugh, just the pulse of the music was like hands that gently pushed her onward, guiding her through the clouds like, hello, Reese. And then Feyre can discern faces that are fair and sorrowful in these clouds, which we know now are a glimpse into the inner circle chills that just shot up my body oh my god later in Akamath Feyre will be walking the Sidra with Reese and realize that it was him who did this and her first question is why and Reese responds I'm going to try to get through this without crying <laughs> quote because you were breaking and I couldn't save you Breathe, Nicole, you can do this. It is also not an accident how in this vision, Feyre is flying. She will learn how to fly both metaphorically and literally. But what she realizes in this conversation with Reese and Akamath is that she was flying in the night court. Quote, I'd seen a palace in the sky when I hallucinated, a place between sunset and dawn, a house of moonstone pillars. Sunset and dawn, aka night. She saw the house of wind. Reese does mention how he's confused. He's like, I didn't send those images to you. What I always figured is that in this moment in her cell, she is unknowingly looking into his mind and seeing him in her own POV, just like she will at the very end of the book, seeing through his eyes of him flying by the house of wind using their bond as she will come to learn this bridge where they can both cross in this vision she was reese in the memory of him flying into the night court ah and home she got a glimpse into her metaphorical home which was reese and his family and where he considered home volaris quote i told you we're gonna have a lot of quotes of this part i wept to be so close to that palace wept from the need to be there everything i wanted was there the one that i loved was there this is both an intertwining with Reese's own desires through their mating bond, like Nicole said, and of course, heavy foreshadowing to the point where you have to wonder about the role fate actually plays in her future. That's a whole other conversation. It's not for today. It's not for this moment here, but it is something to think about. But going back to that quote here, everything she wanted was in this palace. Hello, the house of wind. All her and Reese's chosen family are in there. The one she loves is in there. Reese and Reese for her. It's just so beautiful. I failed. I started crying as you were You talking. started crying. <laughs> While I am sure that this was not Reese's intention to have her think about, after she's flying through the House of Wind, she thinks about Tamlin and how he whispers. <laughs> There's a splash of cold water <laughs> on us. <laughs> and how he whispers that he loves her. The following sentence, however, was his intent to send her this musical message. Quote, it was this I was fighting for. This I had sworn to save. 
this is Reese reminding her of hope. Let's go back to that word that has been constantly said throughout this podcast and this feeling of living for something again, just as he had lived for his inner circle, for Valaris, for the court of dreams, the last 50 years. Reese sent this music to Feyre because it was the only thing he could do in that moment to help save her from breaking, to remind her that there is good and beauty and art and hope in this world, which pulls her out of that dark, dark hole she had fallen into, reminding her that she had a reason to fight. She's going through hell in order to live to fight another day, to experience these wonderful, beautiful things again, to see the night sky, to hold her love, and to feel happiness and experience beauty once again. And right now, she of course pairs all of those emotions with Tamlin. She's not going to feel or experience any of that true happiness again until I think Starfall, actually. Like, I'm again, I'm going off of memory here, but I think it's not until Starfall when she's literally at the place she's thinking of right now with the one she loves because she's falling in love with him at Starfall watching the night sky. Oh my God. <laughs> God damn it. I love this book. <laughs> Last thing I want to know in this scene is that Feyre thinks, quote, two more days until my final trial, just two more days, and then I will learn what the eddies of the cauldron had planned for me. Lexi, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first time she thinks about the cauldron as the stirrer of fate, if you will. <laughs> but um, boom, but um, <laughs> I think so. And, and it is also priming us for her big trust and fate in her third trial. She's going to be really going into that then, which, yeah, that, again, I can't think about the third trial. That's going to be so brutal to deep dive. Anyway, <laughs> well, here's something else for you to think about. Our bowels turn watery <laughs> count. When we there is no smooth transition from the music to that. <laughs> I tried to go into like smooth transition and then my brain went to a really gross place and I'm not going to even get out there right <laughs> <laughs> when Reese goes to interrogate the summer court fairy, Feyre mentions how her bowels turned watery with the fear and shame as he wet himself watching Reese stalk towards him. BTW, count number three. And I think that this is the last one. I don't think we get any in future books. And I, I, oh, we do. I know we oh, do. Okay. <laughs> I am lying. All right. While we already highlighted so many key foreshadowing moments, let's turn our full attention on to foreshadowing, specifically to the rest of this book and other important moments in the series. Feyre thinks to herself how she had no choice but to agree to Amarantha's bargain, even if it violated one of Alice's rules. And again, I want to highlight the meaning of choice here because of how central a theme it is to our reader story and how much foreshadowing there is for the next book. Under the Mountain, most of Feyre's choices are stripped of her. She has little to no control over her life and her body. And when she returns to the spring court, those same feelings of lack of choice and control carry through and will be absolutely suffocating for her. Feyre stresses over how, with Amarantha's stress of the word immediately, that she just might keep them under the mountain even after her trials are over. This is indeed Amarantha's master plan. Even when Feyre finishes all the trials, Amarantha pulls out this exact extendo card, leaving Feyre to solve the riddle in a bit of a state. We'll get to that next episode. Can't wait. Reese mentions to Feyre that unless she has some kind of powers she's not telling him, there's no way human bones will heal so quickly. First off, she will have powers and keep them hidden from the outside world. And second, one of those powers will be healing people quickly, like Reese and when he's about to die. <laughs> Reese mentions how it's custom in his court that bargains mean tattoos. We will see this many, many times in the night court between Reese and Thera, Cassian and Nesta, the Bone Carver, Bryaxes, Striga, just to name a few. Bryaxis? I like how you went Bryaxes. I'm sorry. I just like automatically think Game of Thrones whenever I see that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. When Reese says to Amarantha and Tamlin that their deal is for the rest of her life, Faber remarks how it sounds as if he thinks it will be a long, long while, planting the seeds not only because he fucking believes in her, but also planting the seeds for an immortal FMC by the end of this book. I just realized that the terms of Farah and Reese's
Price's Bargain do not apply the same as the Night Watch and Jon Snow. But did you know, Lexi, that when he bled out in the snow, it looked like a dragon and a wolf coming out? <laughs> and a wolf. Oh, man. And I was part of all that journey when we were all hypothesizing. Yes. <laughs> what a fun time on the internet what a that fun was. fun time to be alive. That was so good. I feel very similar. Now we have fourth wing. I was going to say, yes. <laughs> so similar. <laughs> Lucian says about the bargain with Reese. Yes, well, we'll see about that when the time comes. Lucian and Tamlin will indeed try everything possible to cancel this bargain. And Tamlin will actually succeed in canceling this bargain when he orders the King of Highburn to sever the bond. Little does he know, only the bargain is severed, not the mating bond. The words break the bond will absolutely destroy me when we cover those. I give all... Oh, uh. <laughs> Favor mentions to Resand how Tamlin never treated her like a captive or a slave. I would personally debate the former in the first part of this book, but we will definitely see this on the page early chapters in Akamaf. Reese mentions to Feyre that what he does or does not do for his court is none of her concern. Yet, it will absolutely be her concern next book, and especially when she becomes High Lady. Feyre, when thinking of Jurian killing Clithia, thinks how she would never forgive someone if something happened to her sisters. She will eventually forgive, or at least come to terms with Tamlin for the role he played with everything that went wrong, but she will indeed never forgive Ianthe or the King of Highburn for the role they played with turning Nesta and Elaine. Big, like, forgive question mark next to Tamlin there. Yeah, there's like a, I hope you are happy, but I never want to see your face again. That's exactly what it is, and everybody knows that exact uh, X that we all have. <laughs> One of the shadowy night dressers for Feyre smells of jasmine, which, yes, is one of the main smells of Valaris. And then last but not least, reading the chapter where Reese sends the music to Feyre, you cannot help but think about Nesta hearing the music in A Court of Silver Flames and how it lures her into such a state of peace and ease that she accidentally uses her magic and then bad things happen. I'll be honest, I totally forgot about that part. And I quite recently read Silver Flames. <laughs> Oh, I so love I'll have to that, part. that part. I do have a, and I do have something about how that part is written and how I think it's supposed to lull us because it's it's it goes on for a while and it is very like floofy writing, which is beautiful. It's beautiful writing, don't get me wrong, but it does kind of make the reader like kind of go zone out a little bit. And I think we're supposed to zone out with Nesta in going through that chapter. But I'll get to that in fucking December at this point. <laughs> <laughs> And then like Nicole mentioned with resending her the music, just everything else with the music and Valaris that we already covered. And now it is time to sip some tea with the cereal. Every episode, Lexi is going to sit down for some cereal tea time and walk us through a world building topic to help us better understand this world and the people in it. Today's cereal segment is a follow up to last week's topic, which covered Amarantha's rise to power and the curse she placed on Tamlin and his court. Today is all about under the mountain, Amarantha's court itself, the fairies here, and any politics and scheming that we know of. 49 years ago, Amarantha took control of Perithian and crowned herself High Queen after she tricked the seven High Lords out of most of their power. She set up court in what's called Under the Mountain, which is, surprise, Under a Mountain. This location is important, though. Under the Mountain is nestled in what's called the Middle, dividing the seasonal courts and the solar courts of Perithian. The southern border of the Middle is the Winter Court and the northern border is the Dawn Court. The Middle, and especially this mountain, is sacred, a purposefully unclaimed territory, and it is considered considered neutral land in Perithian. Recall back to the mural that Feyre saw in the study, where the cauldron poured its contents out onto the map. The source of these contents spreading into the lands was this mountain in the middle. This is like where all the liquid was dropped and then it all spread out. The fact that Amarantha tainted it with her reign, it's a really big deal to the people in Perithian. There is an ancient shortcut from the spring court to under the mountain that used to be considered sacred as well, but not anymore. This cave entrance shrinks distances making weeks of travel less than a day of walking. How convenient. 
Now that we know where Under the Mountain is and the symbolism of its location, let's paint a picture of what this court looks like. Amarantha fashioned and modeled Under the Mountain after the Night Court, or rather the Court of Nightmares, also known as the Hewn City. This is the Night Court front, hiding the real beauty and culture of the Night Court in Valaris. The throne room is described as being a giant chamber carved from pale rock, upheld by countless carved pillars. Upon closer look, these pillar carvings depict stories of Perithia and yes, we are talking about that in Mass for His Madness today. There are chandeliers of jewels hung between the pillars, staining the red marble floor with color. On the dais is Amarantha's black throne, plus another black throne for Tamlin. Being underground, we are not at the Ministry of Magic. There are no windows or fake windows here. Amarantha's cronies are either from Highburn, who secretly traveled to Perithian on the trade ships as part of her takeover, or they are the dreadful fairies already in Perithian, who previously did not have an evil villain to flock to. Until, of course, she came along and granted them the atrocities that they wanted to unleash. Some of her cronies include the dungeon guards, who love to torment prisoners, and they have red-colored skin and some really big, scary teeth. Of course, we also have the adder, who seems to be Amarantha's number one crony. Who's number one? While we don't have a lot of information about the other fairies in her court, we get a few descriptions to paint a small picture of them. Farrah saw leering faces that were cruel and harsh in the crowd under the mountain, with the high fae primarily located in the most esteemed area like the throne room. Speaking of, let's talk about the dynamics of Amarantha's reign over these seven high lords and their courts. She used the high lords' stolen powers to bind the fairies of the court to their land, so they could not travel to other fae territories to organize the High Lord started using foolish humans that crossed the wall to serve as messengers, in other words, the children of the Blessed. The High Lords tried to send the mortals, mostly young women, to other fairy territories to ask for help and rally forces. But Amarantha caught these messengers before they left Perthian shores and unfortunately tortured them to death. Amarantha keeps most courts trapped under the mountain, tormenting them as she pleases. However, some courts swear allegiance and serve Amarantha, so she allows them a little more freedom to come and go under the mountain as they please. Reese is one good example of this. I don't know, but I'm going to guess Baron of the Autumn Court and his family is as well. The Spring Court has been the only court allowed to freely live, and I say freely with some air quotes, but comparatively, they had a pretty good. We don't know a whole lot more about how the courts come and go or how they live just day to day under the mountain. We do get confirmation that Amarantha is planning to take Perithian's armies fully under her control and how the King of Hybern is not pleased with this fool's bargain Amarantha has entered with Feyre. He's keeping a close eye on her so she doesn't ruin everything over her obsessive focus on Tamlin, exactly like what happened with her obsessive torturing of Jurian in the war 500 years ago. At least during the months that Feyre is under the mountain, Amarantha hosts parties and gatherings most nights, lots of strong fairy wine and dancing and bad music. Now, how does Under the Mountain contain all the fairies from these seven courts, you ask? The answer is rather unfortunate. It's actually downright sad, to be honest. The nobles and favored fairies are allowed to dwell under the mountain, but if they weren't working to bring in goods and food, they were locked in camps in a network of tunnels beneath the mountain. Thousands of lesser fairies were crammed into chambers and tunnels with no light, no air for 50 years. Some went mad and began preying on others when Amarantha's guards forgot to feed them. Oh my God. Some banded together and prowled the camps, doing absolutely unspeakable things to the weaker fairies. That is so heartbreaking to think about. To wrap this up, I'm going to jump ahead in our story a little bit and share what happens to this court under the mountain after Amarantha's fall. Once the High Lords regain control of Perithian following the death of Amarantha, her court under the mountain is destroyed and sealed off, and the middle is no longer used as a neutral place. Nobody wants to touch this area with a 10-foot pole after the trauma and horrors that Amarantha inflicted upon all of them. Oh my God. <laughs> I know that was a really depressing one, huh? <laughs> well, I'll lighten the mood a little bit because we got a comment on one of our videos, the Adder Bartok uh, video. And it was like, I need a video of Amarantha and the Adder singing in the dark of the night. Da, 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 da. <laughs> we do need to do that. Yes. <laughs> so there, there's your happy transition into favorite moments. I love that as Amarantha is giving favor the riddle, Reese is watching her and smiling faintly. On the first read, you think it's, oh, because, you know, he enjoys watching her try to attempt to figure this out in like a sinister way. But on a reread, it feels like this is one of those rare moments where he's just able to watch this girl that he's been seeing for years. Like he almost doesn't believe that again, yes, there she is right in front of him. And it makes him 
maybe happy is not the right word, but hopeful, definitely. At least that's my head canon, being the hopeless romantic that I am. Another one is that I love from Feyre, quote, I could take down a giant worm, but washing a floor, that was the impossible task. Another moment I love similar to this is during the second task when Feyre thinks it must be a riddle, a logic problem, a maze of words worse than any worm's labyrinth. And then moving forward here, it's such a small moment, but I love how Feyre subconsciously hid her tattooed left arm behind her back when she encountered the lady of the autumn court she feels so self-conscious about her bargain with this bad guy high lord of the night court this is only the beginning of her guilt and shame wearing that tattoo which will bleed into her time back in the spring court in akamath i love how the music at the parties under the mountain suck just like i think that's absolutely hilarious like of course it would suck under the mountain where culture and art and creativity are just sucked away it's described as queer off-kilter music which contrasts so much with all the beautiful music we hear in this book and even in this stretch of chapters when Feyre hears the music in her cell, the writing is superb, but there's one line in particular I want to pull. In addition to the other 15,000 that we pulled <laughs> earlier, quote, the music rose louder, grander, faster from where it was played, a wave that peaked, shattering the gloom of my cell. I love that shattering the gloom of my cell. Oh, so Me good. Too. Me too. Friends, we are about to begin our mass verse madness section because this episode isn't long enough. <laughs> <laughs> if you've only read Akatar and leaving us now, next episode, we will be covering the end of this book, chapters 42 through 46. And if you're not already following us on Instagram and TikTok, what are you doing? Be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. Also, be sure to sign up for our monthly newsletter that goes out on the last Thursday of every month. And if you want even more, if that's not enough for you, be sure to join the Patreon party at the link in our show notes. Also, do not forget to rate and review the podcast. It takes two seconds to hit that five star button on whatever podcasting platform you are listening on. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that like and subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And last but not least, do not forget to share this with your fellow Akatar friends who are also feeling very conflicted about Resand. All right, we are now going to enter our Mass vs. Madness segment of the episode, where we call out series crossover references or discuss theories. Today's Mass vs. Madness includes spoilers for all three Crescent City books, specifically the third one, House of Flame and Shadow, and all of the Throne of Glass series. In fact, I was doing some deep dives and I got some major spoilers for, I think, Kingdom of Ash here. If you don't want spoilers for these books, we are lovingly saying goodbye and we'll see you again soon or just skip on over to the bloopers. All right, to kick us off today, this is is going to be a long one here. Shock of shocks. <laughs> There's a theory that Amarantha is Volg, and we'll explore this more in future books as we dissect the King of Highburn also being a possible Volg too, but of course we got to talk about Amarantha right here. While Amarantha is very powerful, I'd assume she would be a Volg princess and not a queen. Princesses are not as powerful as queens. I imagine the King of Highburn would be a Volg king in comparison. If you need a quick reminder, Volg are demons from another realm in the Throne of Glass series. Series. They are powerful and malicious and can possess people by going inside the host bodies to control them. Volg princes, or princesses in this case, are especially cold and calculating. They delight in both emotional pain as well as physical torture. Hey, that sounds like our girl Amarantha compared to the regular Volg, which are more like Volg royalties. I'll say henchmen. The Adder, speaking of henchmen, is a very similar description as the Ilken, which are huge demonic creatures with large wings and venomous claws. They are cronies of the Volg, so this would definitely fit for the Adder to be like an Ilken if Amarantha or Hybern are Volg. So Adders do live in the Aurelia world. I have not finished the series and I do not know that. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Hybrid's book does seem to be a wordmark book. So Amarantha may be using the Throne of Glass universe magic because, well, hey, they're crossovers. Amarantha, this is one of the biggest emphases of why people think that she is a Volg. She has black eyes, which is the signature trait of a Volg inside someone. So Amarantha may be Volg, specifically a prince because of how powerful she is. Now, here's one thing I do want to say is that Amarantha's blood in the next stretch is not described as black. And that would be Correct. something definitely described. However, Maeve, who is a Volg queen, did convinced did trick Rowan and the fellow cadre into believing that she was not Volg and she was just totally normal by 
glamoring for lack of a better term glamoring her blood to appear normal so this is not out of the question that that magic does exist and that amarantha could have done that but what a time to do that is like oh my god my throat's being ripped out by a man bear pig but glamour <laughs> speaking of which amarantha isn't necessarily beheaded which is one of the surefire ways to kill a vog plus fire is another way but her throat is literally ripped out by tamlin so i guess close enough I will say this. I don't think Amarantha has enough of her own power to inflict onto others the way that the Volg easily can. She more so seems to use the high phase trapped powers against them to protect herself from them. But hey, I love this theory. I think it's fun and possible, especially with the whole like her red blood having to be glamored there. If she is a Volg, though, I'm going to go with no on the Tamlin is her mate theory. I don't think that both of them would be true if either one of them are true. Having Tamlin's mate be a Volg, that would be a real tough look for yeah. him. And I don't think that fits. <laughs> I would go more with she is using the magic of word marks and is not Volg. Yes, me too. Yeah, that, I think that would be more what I'd lean towards. An old name from one of our earlier dialects. What earlier dialects? Could this be a Prithian version of the old language? Or could this be the language that Amorin mentions in the Book of Breathings, like I mentioned earlier, aka the language of Bryce's tattoo, aka, 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 word marks? I doubt it just because word marks are so unique and like how they're described and how, and like, especially with the book of breathings, like it's possible, but I doubt it. I think it's more likely that this old language is closer to Rowan's tattoo, which is in a script of an old language, specifically not stated as word marks. I agree with that, especially with saying earlier dialects. I don't think that is the old Fey language that hasn't been spoken in 15,000 years. Like that shocked Amran. Yeah. So I don't think that this would be just casually tossed around in this way. So I do think that it is more so just one of their older dialects. And it plays a lot more into Feyre's heritage versus the multiverse there. Agreed. I do love the idea that's a, that it's in the sim same or similar language as Rowan's tattoos. I want to I, learn I hadn't thought about it that way. I love that so much. <sighs> yes, yes, love yes. you, Rowan. You beautiful silver hair man. Lady of Autumn. We gotta talk about her. So it is interesting that we never learn the Lady of Autumn's name, like I mentioned in the deep dive. But like most questions, I went to Reddit. And Kara Auden had an interesting post about this, wondering if after we learned about her affair with Helion, Baron pulled some Tog magic using a similar spell that was put on the King of Otterland, aka Dorian the First, and made to forget their name and identity. Personally, I am leaning away from this theory because of how she is still so connected emotionally to Lucian and wanting to save him. And we saw what happened to Daddy O'Dorian. He didn't give a flying fuck about baby Dorian. But on this thread, Nate Translates had a different take, wondering if her name is instead more of a connection to the Autumn King or Rune Danon's line. Since we know his line of fae is from the Prithian world, this would not be out of the question if they are related. Now, Rune looking just like Reese is where I have some raised eyebrows on that, but I just found it interesting, the idea that Lady of Autumn's name could be connected to these other worlds as well. Next. <laughs> <laughs> The Midgard worm being from Midgard, question mark, question mark, because of the portals in these worlds, it is not out of the question that the Midgard worm is from Crescent City's Midgard. Bryce even asks if they came from her world originally, and I quote, horrific as the creature was to have another being from her world here was oddly comforting. That's... <laughs> a Bryce reaction to say the least. That's a Bryce Crescent City <laughs> 3 reaction to say the yeah. least. Yeah. <laughs> then Nesta goes on to be like, I don't fucking know. Like, how would I know? She doesn't even know that Bryce's world existed a week ago. Of course she doesn't know. And I love how Nesta goes on to confirm that the Midgard worms aren't common, but she mentions how Feyre defeated one. I absolutely loved seeing this on the page when I was reading House of Flame and Shadow, tying us right back to this first book and Feyre's first task going up against one. And Nesta's like, dang, I thought she exaggerated the painting, but nope, that thing is as terrifying as she depicted. What a sisterly reaction right there. <laughs> 
but just in general, we get a Midgard worm in both books. Granted, it's in the same world that they occur, but it was nice to see the Alaskan bullworm again in House of Flame and Shadow. And just a quick note to kind of more, even more so separate these. Midgard in Norse, in Old Norse, means Middle Earth. And Midden, as in the first part of Midgard worm, in Old Norse means manure pile. And in Norse, dragons are typically depicted as worms and stated as such, but it's typically spelled W-O-R-M. So if we're really translating this word for, like, basically word for word, in Old Norse, Midgard worm means manure pile dragon. <laughs> So I, I do not it. think that they are connected. <laughs> this next crossover call out is actually in reference to our Under the Mountain surreal segment after highlighting the sacred mountain in the middle. While under the mountain, Feyre notices carvings on the walls that depicted fairies and high fae and animals in various environments and states of movement. They're described as stories of Perithian. You know where else we've seen these stories of a land? Let's go back to House of Flame and Shadow with Vesperus, one of the Daglin, and the only one left behind after the rest were defeated and forced to flee Perithian. This is the one Bryce stupidly frees and Nesta has to kill. I know Nicole's like, don't you dare get on this high horse right now. We don't have time for that. <laughs> Go listen to our CC3 reactions video. Or our Vesperus interview with Daniel where he just goes off on this book. Vesperus and the rest of the Daglin had hidden a pool of their magic under, quote, every sacred mountain. Amaranthus Court under the mountain is literally under one of Perithian's sacred mountains. So we can infer that the Daglin hid one of their magical pools in this sacred mountain. We see more of these kind of carvings in the caves in part one of House of Flame and Shadow when Azriel, Bryce, and Nesta are heading towards the prison and encounter Vesperus. The carvings show warnings of booby traps and stories of great fate battles, lovemaking, and childbirth, a masked queen, and a crown on her head, burr, 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 bearing instruments in her hand. Hello, dread troves. They are also in a sacred mountain at the time. And then there are also these carvings in Avalon's caves called the Cave of Princes or Helena's Cave. Remember that Avalon is considered a thin place, which makes it ideal for traveling between or communicating with other worlds. It is where Peleus, the first starborn prince who originated from Perithian and his descendants rested. This is a whole other rabbit hole to go down. I'm going to stop here and simply stick to pointing out these story carvings and how they all tie together in our stories. Makes you wonder if there's more to these sacred mountains than we already know. And I could definitely see us exploring more of their meanings and how these worlds are further connected with Nesta on her quest to see why she was chosen for the eight-pointed star. All right, friends, there's honestly more that we could dive into for today's Mass First Madness, like a re is starborn and the autumn court slash the autumn king but we have to pace ourselves so we're going to stop here because this episode is way too long and it's time to wrap it up for context we had to do this episode in two settings for our sanity <laughs> but and folks, you're probably having to listen to this in multiple settings probably <laughs> but folks that is it thank you so much for coming to our penultimate episode for Akatar. So much fun. Next episode, we will be covering the end of Akatar, chapters 42 through 46. As always, to our executive producer, Hayden, aka our sanity manager, we love you. If you are absolutely loving Fantasy Fangirls and want to support us more and get more content and community, be sure to join our Patreon party at patreon.com slash fantasy fangirls. We have those two tiers and we hope to see you in there. On that same note of more content, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. It goes out once a month and we recently sent out our March one. So if you didn't get it and you're like, oh my gosh, I need April's, be sure to subscribe in the link in our show notes. And of course, if you're not following us on Instagram and TikTok, what are you doing? Go give us a follow at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. Also, do not forget to rate and review the episode. If you are listening to us on a podcasting platform and you have not hit that five-star rating or review button, it is so helpful, not only for us as a show, but also for any podcast that you listen to. And it is such a, it's two seconds. It's two seconds of your life. You can do it. Or if you're watching us, first of all, thank you so much for looking at our beautiful faces for the X amount of hours that you've been looking at them. <laughs> but please do not forget to like and subscribe to the channel. It is so helpful for us. And th thank you so much to the 14,000 of you who are on there. Holy shit. I never thought I would say that. <laughs> and last but not least, <laughs> please, the most important thing that you can do is share this with your fellow at Guitar friends. If you also 
were like, maybe don't paint your mate, Resand. This is a great episode to send to your friend who also feels a similar way. And then you can vent about it together. All right. We love you so much. We will see you next week to wrap up Akatar before we head on into Akamath. I'm so excited. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> to get this going. We can do this. Illiterate. There we go. And uh, am I literate? <laughs> Excited to pot. And that's, pot, and that's right? why we're, I lost my place. Sorry, there was a jet apparently over my head. I, I, I figured. Oh dear. <laughs> Morals. We'll, we'll Morals. <laughs> Feyre, say it with Violet Soren Gale. I will not I die will today. Not die today. <laughs> Wait, let's do that again. Yeah. yeah. I will not, I die, will not today. die today. How are we saying it? <laughs> Girl, she loses. Lures, lures. We will later learn that lerm. <laughs> worm, lerm. <laughs> Breath to like drop. I'm like, <laughs> I lost my place. There we go. What did I? What does that? I'm sorry, I'm dying. <laughs> Hold on one second. I wish he was doing all of us. <laughs> we really get that driving home in chapters 50. Oh, that's not the chapter. <laughs>